this is a good time to Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. And Vincent, could you put us on gallery view, take away the screen share? Thank you. Uh, welcome to day two of this momentous meeting. Um, thank you all for the work that you did in preparation for the meeting and particularly for the work that you did yesterday during the meeting. And for many of you, the work that you did after the meeting to get us ready for today. Um, okay. So it, it was, it's very much and greatly appreciated. Um, and I wanna just check my mic just to make sure that I'm coming through okay. Is it being heard okay? All right, because yesterday there were some problems. So when I was health commissioner in Minnesota, every summer I would put on my knickers and my suspenders and my bow tie and I'd go around the state and organize something called Pitch the Commissioner. I'd go to communities and, and pitch horseshoes with county commissioners and health board members and hospital administrators and school board members and members of the community. And they would pitch me ideas while we pitched horseshoes. Uh, it was great because for, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, we were outside with some physical activity. And at least in Minnesota, oftentimes people share more when they're not looking you right in the eye and actually when they're looking in the distance and walking side by side. The other is that the that that horseshoe pitching was a good metaphor, and like most metaphors, they're not perfect. But certainly, that stake in the middle of the horseshoe pit, the individual in the middle of community, uh, it was a good metaphor. And the fact that many people couldn't get into to the the horseshoe pitching area or have access to horseshoes themselves are sort of the social determinants of health. How do you actually have access to the game itself? And then the horseshoes were sort of the public, or were sort of the policies and programs. And you certainly didn't want them to go too far to the left towards just prevention or too far to the right to, for treatment. You wanted them right in the middle where you had a balance between treatment and prevention. And you also didn't want them to go too far over the stake or too short when you had both too much public or too much private in terms of po policies and programs. You want them just right in the middle, a good balance. And then certainly the horseshoes themselves the policies and programs, if they were turned just right, if they really focused on equity, they could get around that stake and actually score the maximum amount, have the maximum amount of impact. And that was sort of that equity theme. But also in horseshoes, you know, you don't you don't just move ahead with the ringers, the, the you know, the successes, switching metaphors, the home runs, the grand slams. Sometimes in horseshoes, the closer you get, the more likely you are to, to at least score a little bit of points. So that's what I'm hoping today, or well, that's actually why I'm wearing my horseshoe tie. I usually, my bow ties usually have the theme that I'm talking about. So we're, we're pitching ideas. We're here today, we're gonna to be pitching some recommendations to the secretary and to the federal administration. And I hope that our, our recommendations bring everybody into the game, that nobody's left out and that we get as close to getting a ringer with all of our recommendations, recognizing that we may get, not to get a ringer every time, but we'll get, we'll get close and that everybody has a chance to play. And then we're looking at programs and policies and public and private efforts. Um, so I'm really excited about today because I think we have the opportunity to really move the ball, the horseshoe forward. <laughs> In, in advancing the health of, of mothers and babies. And so those recommendations that we're gonna come up with today are gonna to be an important part of it. And we have some other members joining or other folks joining us today that are gonna push us even a little bit further in terms of data and also the whole issue of racism. So this is going to be an exciting day, an important day, and one that I hope that we can all really weigh in on and, and move things forward. Um, but to start, I do want to ask Lee to talk a little bit about um, our conflict of interest and the ethics, because uh, yesterday, came, a couple of times it came up, there are, there are members who are doing things that relate directly to what we're talking about. So I want to make sure that we're clear about conflicts of interest and how we may want to uh, 
keep ourselves from certain boats if we come to that point. So Lee, could you uh, give us a little fill in here? Sure, thanks folks. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, Jeannie, uh, <laughs> wherever each of you are. Um, it's good to see you again today and thank you um, for all of the hard work you did yesterday. Um, yesterday evening, um, we we really do appreciate it. I was pleased to see the degree to which so much of um, what you're talking about and the recommendations that you're making align with some of the questions that we have about program direction, um, regardless of whether uh, what you're talking about makes it into official recommendations to the secretary. Um, we are using your words in uh, our, at our program level in the design of supplements uh, for doula, for um, health, the Healthy Start program, for um, targeting um, some of our efforts on um, uh, some of the most, most needy places in the country for uh, infant mortality, maternal mortality. So it is very practical work for, for our staff. So thank you there. There are a couple uh, quotes that came up yesterday that I just want to reiterate for you that I think um, it struck me um, and they lead into this discussion of ethics. First was uh, one comment, which I just found funny that um, you can't fatten a cat by weighing it. Um, and all that we spend a lot of time on data and data collection, there needs to be action that follows that data. And I think that's important. Um, also Magda had pointed out that um, there's, we should always take time to acknowledge good work and, and offer thanks. So thanks to all of you for this work and your continuing work. And the final um, thought was the one that um, I had had as I was listening to the introductions from folks yesterday about the work that they do and their um, background in uh, the, what brings them here. And that is for all of us, um, our, prefer our professional lives and our personal lives are intertwined and they're not separate from each other that we live what we work and we work what we live. And so in the work that you are doing, the work that makes you experts means that you are engaged in some of the programs very personally that you're making recommendations on. Um, it is why you qualify as experts here and it is something that we have um, procedures and policies for addressing through the ethics process that come down in the laws for the Federal Advisory Committees Act. Um, why we have an ethics official who works with us, why we have a designated federal official, um, and why you all fill out the forms that you do. Um, we are going to ask each of you to make sure that the forms that you have submitted reflect the currency of the work that you're doing so that you can um, be a honest, good, true, reputable uh, civil servant as a federal advisory committee, which you are accepted federal officials. Um, and that you're keeping with those requirements. We do um, do those, we do checks to make sure that you are covering all of that, but I would ask you to make sure that if things have changed in the past, if you over, if uh, based on oversight, you did not include something in those, um, in those descriptions that you update that. Second, we understand that um, not all of them are things that you necessarily, that disqualify you from being able to comment and reflect on um, or opine on in recommendations. And so we would just ask you to be cautious when it comes to a vote, that if you, um, if you are feeling like there is a conflict of interest or that you have, especially in some dealings, financial, uh, potential financial gain or benefit from those decisions that you respectfully recuse yourself from making a vote on those activities or those, those recommendations that could be seen as potential conflict of interest as it relates to the federal government, the, the appearance of conflict of interest is conflict of interest. So please be aware of that. I do and intend to treat all of you as expert professionals. We are not going to uh, call out any individuals. We are not gonna ask any individuals to name what they're involved in or not involved in. That is a personal matter between you and the ethics officer, but we are going to assume that you are uh, abiding by those rules um, in good faith. So if you do need to have further conversations or discussions with us, I'm available, Vanessa is available and you have the contact information for the FACA officials that did your clearance. 
So um, go forward from here as you make those votes, if you choose to recuse yourself or not, not vote, just make a statement about that. The second item that I would just like to raise, and this is a follow-on conversation with Ed, and then if you have any questions, we can, we can take them, is um, you have made a number of recommendations, um, tens of recommendations to go to the secretary. And we all know that busy people have narrow um, attention spans. Um, some of your recommendations are more central to the committee and the legislative requ uh, requirements and um, uh, authorization of the committee and what, what its purpose is. Some of them are very valuable, very worthwhile. Um, they may not be either as specific as um, one might like for making a policy decision, or they may be a step removed from what the actual mission or purpose is from the committee. So I would ask you in your discussions and deliberations to, as best possible, refine and clarify your priorities in some of these areas. If there are two, three, five, ten that you think are essential, I think it would be a great add-on or you know refinement to your work. That's your call. It is a committee that operates independently, and you have the choice to make the recommendations that you choose. But I do think that it may add value. Um, that's all I have. Are there any questions, follow up that you'd like to take up with me at this point? Alrighty then. All right. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Um, you know, and speaking of conflict of interest, Belinda Pettiford had a conflict of interest yesterday. She was before the legislature defending her budget, so couldn't be in two <laughs> places at one time. So she was not with us yesterday, but she's here today. So Belinda, could you introduce yourself to the other, the committee members and everybody else on, on this Zoom call and uh, answer the, the three questions that I had all of the other members do, you know, what do you bring to the table here? Uh, what are the, what's the issue or issues that is of most importance to you and why? Sure, thank you, Ed, and hello everyone. And please know I'd much rather been with you all yesterday. So. It's good to see so many faces and names that I recognize. I am Belinda Pettiford. I work with the North Carolina Division of Public Health and there I'm head of the Women's Health Branch, which includes efforts around maternal health, family planning, preconception health, as well as our state sickle cell program is also part of the work that I'm responsible for. Um, I have been doing this work for 30 plus years. Um, actually, I just had my 34th anniversary doing this work. I started off at the community level um, and worked at a local health department for the first eight years of my career. I had a wonderful health director that told me I could try anything in the community as long as I didn't get him in trouble and myself in trouble. So I spent my first eight years of my career really working in the community, going door to door, working with beauticians and barbers and faith-based organizations and had a wonderful time doing that. And it was actually a difficult decision for me to leave that to, go to the state uh, of the um, level that have enjoyed it uh, and to my work is focused on uh, maternal and child health and specifically on addressing health equity. So from a, looking at your questions, my background is the 30 plus years. Um, and I would say the committee party um, to me, um, I'm always focused and continue to focus on health equity, including anti-racism because I think it is what will help drive our work to improvement. And I think our data is very clear and it tells us what our challenges and our concerns are. Um, but I think some of that includes, we've got to listen to the voices of those impacted, our, the voices of our communities and, and, and spend that time in building those trusting relationships. I think some of the priorities for me for SACOM is looking at the public health workforce and looking at how we identify who is a member of that public health workforce. I think um, the committee's recommendations and moving forward around doula services, community health workers, um, lactation specialists, I think all of those are very important. I think many of those are people that are part of the communities we're trying to have an impact on and to partner with. And I think that helps to build that level of trust. So I think that is very important. I think programs that are supported, supporting individuals and families, I, you know, I, I truly love working in the arena of group prenatal care, um, as well as with some of the group parenting work, I think is critical. But ultimately, I think any of the work and our focus around health equity and anti-racism is very important to me. And I think at SACOM, we need to champion that work. So thanks everyone, and it's again good to see you all. Great, glad you could join us today, Belinda, as, as always. 
All right, so now for the next uh, at least 45 minutes, uh, we're gonna be talking about the recommendations. Just a little bit of background. Just my role has been to try to get as much input from the members as I, and members broadly defined those in the work group into the recommendations. So I, I try to incorporate in all of the recommendations, the wording that is given to me by folks uh, editing a little bit along the way. But uh, so these, these I hope reflect the input uh, of all of the members, everybody who's contributed. Um, I did, I, we talked about language and I know that the um, general vernacular right now is to think about, to speak about black, brown, indigenous and populations of color, BIPOC. So I'm using that acronym uh, because I think that's generally being used. So if you see through this document, you'll see BIPOC, black, brown, uh, indigenous, indigenous and people of color. And uh, so, so that, that is there. Um, and if there are other issues related to uh, language as we go along, you know, bring those up because uh, we will try to be consistent as we, as we go through this. Uh, I do like the, the input that we've, I've received from the members of the equity committee, just to make sure that we're uh, being respectful and, and focusing on assets rather than deficits <clears throat> um, and, and moving from that. Um, what I did, what I sent to you this morning is uh, our documents, a cover letter, which basically is the same as what I sent earlier. There's no, no major change um, other than that. I, I, Jeannie pointed out that we are uh, chartered by, the, by Congress rather than the secretary. So it, it changed that focus. Um, that's the only really big change in that. The background document uh, I think it needs some additional work, but I'm not going to go through that because I, I, it is just background. Uh, and if anybody wants to add some additional things, I think we need to put, as we talk through this, we, we need some additional work. Like Paul Wise said yesterday, you know, he had all those numbers. That would have been nice to put, will be nice to put into the, the background piece on, um, on migrant and immigrant health. Um, I think if we want to do, if we end up with some recommendations related to the Indian Health Service, I think we need some background information on, on Indian health care. Um, so similar kinds of things, just as background, but we're not going to go through that. We're going to go through the recommendations and in the recommendations where there have been significant changes or new uh, recommendations that have been brought forth since the document that we talked about yesterday, those are highlighted in blue. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on. Uh, we're, I'm not gonna go through each of the recommendations again. However, if there are some recommendations that you want to talk about that are not highlighted in blue, please let me know and we can do that. I don't wanna to, to, to ramrod things through. I wanna make sure that everybody, if they have any concerns or suggestions that they, they have a chance to put those forward but I don't, want to, I don't think we have time to go through all of those again. I think we went through them very well yesterday and I, I had a sense that there was some consensus on most of the, the issues. So we're gonna start this session going back to where we ended, really talking about data and research and action. Uh, and because I, we cut Magda and her work to group off a little bit short. So she's gonna start and we're gonna go through those recommendations and then we'll go back to the, uh, the other ones that have been uh, added on. So. Um, Vanessa, can you go back down to the, the bottom part of the recommendations? And Magda, you're on. And you, all right, how about that? Does that now work? I'm hearing now? You. There you go. It muted, you know, technology has a mind of its own. Thank you for artificial intelligence. Uh, and Ed, thank you for reminding me about horseshoes. I'll be the first time that you challenged me when I came to give a talk in Minnesota. First one, I got a ringer. And it gives a false sense of security and accomplishment when you go straight to the ringer. So to follow that out, um, it, it, it is incremental and um, essential collaborative work. So great metaphor. Um, thanks again to my colleagues and also those who took time overnight to send me additional comments, which have been forwarded to Ed and are reflected here. Um, and so a couple of additions, which is why I'm, uh, which is why, can we put on mute someone who has children? That would be great. I love the sound of children, but uh, hard enough hearing without that. Thank you. Um, and so 
uh, we have added actually, so I'm going to start in the beginning, but not go in in full detail under the first item. Um, but I want to reflect some of the input that came in without having adequate discussion yesterday. Um, yes, Lee, we have six recommendations. They likely can be consolidated and some of the research and data recommendations from the other sections could be consolidated here. We will work on a way to make this uh, more compact. Um, and uh, towards this end, I want to um, acknowledge input on the first item about um, strengthening uh, research and data for equity being the, the anchoring um, and centering piece. Um, workforce section did not include essentially the research component of workforce. And in the scientific enterprise, there is underrepresentation of people of color, black, brown, indigenous, tribal, um, more broadly, um, and other underrepresented groups. And so we have added to, uh, for your consideration, under strength and research and data for equity, uh, encourage engagement. And I would add here, Ed, to your edit, encourage engagement and support scientists from diverse backgrounds and invest in and promote the use of strength and data sources, protocol surveillance, evaluation research methods. And so by putting in the, the notion of, of who does this work, um, data do not manifest themselves. Research is not the immaculate conception to borrow a phrase. So we need to have people in the pipeline and people in practice uh, in our data and research um, part of the larger team beyond the care team. Um, and towards that end, we add a new A, which is to engage with organizations, institutions, and entities that are underrepresented in the scientific workforce and provide pathways, I would say provide and support pathways to enhance career development of individuals from BIPOC communities and other underrepresented groups in maternal and infant health. Uh, so that is a workforce addition for your consideration. Otherwise in this number one, it is as we reviewed yesterday and I will not repeat uh, if you have additional comments and, um, and conversation, let's have it. So if we can move on to number two. Enhanced data systems, interoperability, and sharing. Um, in this case, the, we have um, listened to the input from the Data and Research to Action Workgroup and the prior SACA meeting and outlined uh, with the addition of pre-pregnancy and maternity care, we may also add under B2B um, the notion of uh, postpartum care, although that may be inferred in maternity care, we wanna make sure in adding the pre-pregnancy, we also, and we want coverage into the first year of, of uh, following uh, delivery, um, we may wanna make that more clear. Um, but these are the, the notion, and not only do we want to have stronger data systems, we wanna make sure that they work together across sectors. Well. Um, and across disciplines and across parts of government. Um, and uh, that is where we have number two that we quickly reviewed yesterday. And number three um, is a specific investment given the flourishing um, and, and quick up uh, uh, utilization of maternal mortality review and the Maria system and the mortality, the, the mum uh, users group and uh, is over here with CDC funding. And then you have FEMA over under HRSA funding. And so we've been hearing in the field about how we can begin to have greater alignment between um, these two sentinel event review methodologies as an example. And then look at the augmentation of sentinel event methodology around severe morbidity. Um, and other events um, that would welcome, if you will, qualitative data, lived experience and family perspectives so that community voices are an integral part of our definition of what is our data system. So that's what you will see in number three. Um, I'm gonna 
uh, stop there again, because this is as far as I got in my um, abbreviated six minutes uh, yesterday. And I want to take a breath and, and invite with that um, friendly amendment from what surfaced over the evening's time and into this morning, uh, a call for any conversation, questions, um, uh, concerns, additions in this first one, two, and three. If you have any questions, raise your hand in the raise hand area or just speak up. Uh, I'm a, originally an East Coast girl, even though I lived in the Midwest for 30 years. And so I have the count to five rule, like Magda, count to five. So um, uh, hearing none immediately and seeing none in the chat for right now, I want to thank you for giving a chance to digest that first one, two, and three uh, with some friendly suggestions from this morning and move on to four, five, and six. If we could do that, Vanessa. They're shorter, they fit on one screen. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to defer conversation at number four for a moment and just go to five and six. Uh, these were offered with suggestions of members of the draw group. It is in, ex, included in the preamble about the importance of centering the work around policy to include perspectives of maternal and infant health. Um, but research, and we found that particularly in COVID, we were late to the game to have a special consideration and inclusion of women in reproductive aid, pregnant and breastfeeding women and their infants in health services research, including vaccine and medication studies. This is a lesson learned from COVID that we would um, offer um, as an additional data, strengthening data systems through the lens, in this case, of population. And then last, another lesson learned from COVID, which will not be the only or last public health emergency. And we have seen this time and again, whether that's hurricanes, floods, fires, natural disasters, there are those that threaten specifically the lives and well-being of mothers and infants and disproportionately uh, moms and babies of color and of other um, marginalized and often erased groups. And so we have this one size fits all for public health emergency. I think we've learned that we need to look at social inequity during emergencies, which is why we'd like to have a, a ending COVID, we hope, time to uh, include a broader lesson learned in five and six. I wanna thank the input from our colleagues in drawing, particularly Allison, uh, Cernich for, for helping us uh, consider these possibilities. Uh, and I'd like to open any discussion about five or six. Amanda, this is Janelle, just um, again, uh, looking at the language and um, again, our New York City midwife, Pat Lofman, is just calling our attention to um, rewording a sentence, um, eliminating the two underrepresented words that maintain the spirit of the recommendation. So, um, Pat, so noted. I I saw it come you. up. Pat, thanks so much. And Janelle, we will. Uh, my assurance as a member of SACOM is that um, we are continuing to use what we learn with intention and consciousness and respect. And so, yes, we'll be delighted and important to modify language to in that spirit. And Vanessa, if you can help me make sure that happens. And then sorry, last. Just so I, Magda yeah, and Pat, sorry, which, um, was that under recommendation one, just to get, be sure I'm clear which lines we were talking about from Pat's comment? Um, and Janelle, can you help us here? Because um, I believe that it is. It's um, in 1A. It's no, in 1A. One. One um, I think the question here is underrepresented in the scientific workforce. And I think that's technically correct. It, um, however, this is something that you and I have spoken, given your own background. The alternative language from you and Pat would be?
I would say I would suggest that if you have some specific suggestions, put those in the chat or give them to us as a, as an email later. We will do right. the editing and you know right. try to go through all of those things, but trying to right. to, to edit it online now will take a lot of time. Right. So let's just we'll come back. Thank to you. Perf I just want to make sure it's noted there, Vanessa, so that it's recorded to go back to. That's my point here, Ed, not to wordsmith, to make sure it's reflected in Vanessa's comments. Then if you could go to the very last one, please. One of the suggestions that came up uh, yesterday um, was, uh, which I raised, I take responsibility for, which is not only do we wanna have data that translates to action, that we use data, but that we are making, as Lee noted, a slew of recommendations, which we hope can be perhaps consolidated and who knows prioritized, but in the more strategic packaging. The notion that in each of the sections, except for workforce and uh, maternity care services and systems, um, we have no measurement recommendation about the impact of those policy recommendations. And so instead of putting it in the end of each section, we've crafted language that says measure and monitor impact. That means across all of the recommendations that are forthcoming to support data and research to monitor and assess or could support data and assessment. We can look at the language to monitor and assess the impact of these recommend, all of our recommendations. Um, and so this is a way for us to hold ourselves accountable for having made these evidence informed recommendations and encourage someone uh, we encourage investments, if you will, um, in, in knowing what is the difference that they may have made. Um, a more general blanket, but that is a, um, a remedy to the recommendation uh, suggestion that was made yesterday. So I want to open it uh, there with an understanding that this will be the segue back, Ed, to going back to the very beginning. Um, but this notion of measure and monitor the difference we make by what we recommend so that it word goes to deed and deed is accountable. And I would think that we may even want to put this in, in the initial uh, recommendation preamble. Yeah, and then the preamble and say that, you know, we're going to be putting all of these recommendations forward and we want to make sure that they're, we evaluate those and, you know, find some way to actually raise it up to in that opening paragraph or two paragraphs. Any other thoughts from folks? Well, that's a good town to 10 East Coast style. Um, again, I want to uh, end with extraordinary gratitude to the Data and Research to Action Workgroup and its collaboration with the other two workgroups, both our ex officio members, our SACA members, and our robust external members who have contributed um, uh, perspectives and voice. And with that, I pass it back to you, Ed. All right. Thank you, Marga. And thank you for the, the work that your group has, has done on this. So let's go back to the very top and point out a couple of things. We'll kind of walk through this and, and people who have been working on this can jump in when it gets to that point. Uh, it was highlighted then the very first paragraph, which I didn't have in blue, but I just want to say that we went, we changed the wording from uh, should to must. You know, SACOM believes healthcare system that it must be of the highest as opposed to should be. You know, and I think we want to kind of proactively uh, state what we really believe in. Um, so just, uh, just highlighting that. Um, and then we get into the care systems. Let's go down to the care systems and this, the particularly we uh, added something about risk appropriate care. Steve, do you wanna talk about that? Steve, unmute your mic and here I am, very sorry, I'm back. Um, <clears throat> thanks to Wanda Barfield for the assistance with this. Um, one of the benefits of being on the committee is that um, I know all of us, but I in particular have been learning all of the various resources of the federal government. I mean, it, it's obviously a large um, entity and HHS has as many parts of it that I've become more familiar with. Uh, she pointed out that the locate E or the, um, uh, I think it's location of, um, uh, oh gosh, um, the uh, 
it's it, it it's a a tool that allows better utilization of resources in states and the tool is really useful so wanda pointed out that we need to include risk appropriate a risk appropriate care recommendation so um she sent um this and the one thing that we added to it is that there are times where uh, babies being transported in utero are actually the ideal transport. I recall <clears throat> during medical school just being impressed about the fact that trans transporting in, uh, in utero can sometimes be the best thing for a baby to a better level of care. Uh, but in any case, we added um, the fetuses who are identified with some problems that can be managed or treated in utero. That's happening around the country. Uh, Tara pointed that out and for those who will need neonatal care. So um, I, I think this is a really important thing. And if we're, and I'm sure we're going to do some consolidation of the recommendations in the area of care system and financing. Uh, but this is one that I think is right uh, very near the top, probably uh, at the top. Uh, any, anyone have any comments or questions about that? I don't know if Wanda is with us today, maybe, uh, hearing a little bit about the uh, locate uh, CDC locate tool. It's something I was not familiar with. I, I'm familiar with the concept, but it's a federal tool that's really useful for a number of states. Some are participating, I think 22 states, unfortunately not Minnesota. We are using it in North Carolina, Steve. Um, it's yeah. the levels of care assessment. Um, I know it's, there's another letter there that I'm missing as well. And, and transport, a, I think maybe. Right levels of care assessment tool. Um, and we actually, you know, it is it's part of the process if you're trying to either develop or, get, or update your levels of care in your state. Um, um, like in my own state of North Carolina, we don't have maternal levels of care. So we have actually partnered with um, and contracted with some entities to work with all of our delivering hospitals in our state to go out and work with them in completing this levels of care tool, the CDC tool. We've been working with CDC a couple of years on it. It started with some of the work with the um, the coin work that um, the, that HRSA came out with several years ago, I wanna say like 2014, 2016, the Collaborative Improvement and Innovation Network, and it was around perinatal regionalization. So there were multiple coins, but this one was specific to perinatal regionalization. And that's where some of the conversations began with Wanda Barfield and others at that point in time. And, but it is a tool that kind of helps determine um, based on your capacity as a, a delivering hospital, what do you actually have in place and what should you have in place? And it connects really with the recommendations that have come out of ACOG and the Maternal, Meta, Maternal Fetal Medicine Society for the maternal levels of care. And then on the neonatal side, it's coming out of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So all of it does connect, but it is one step. It's not the only step, but it is a good uh, first step in really making the determination around determining what your levels of care are for your hospitals if you don't actually already have a system in place. Yep. And this might be someplace where we might wanna work with uh, MCHB. I, I see that Dr. Warren made some comment about uh, you know things going on at MCHB, where we may wanna harmonize what's going on and, and clarify this recommendation so that it gets all of the tools that are out there. Yep. All right. Any, any concerns with this approach that, that people might have? If not, let's then go down to number 13 and 14. And well, let's start with, with 14, because that is what Steve had brought this up and we had not talked a lot about number 13. So let's start with, with 14. Steve, uh, sure. you raised the whole issue about financing of care. Right. Yeah. And I was, I think, pretty transparent about kind of what I've been working on, which was actually when I came on the committee, I was told this was a reason that uh, because I was working in this area. Um, but this actually also uh, is a contribution from uh, Wanda. Um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation uh, is clearly working on bundled payments and there's almost, there's a commitment for bundled payment for services, whether it's capitated primary care uh, service over a period of time or things like joint 
uh, replacements, um, spine surgery, bariatric surgery, other areas. Um, so this, this came uh, from, from a suggestion by Wanda to, uh, to fund pilots that will test the costs, benefits, and limitations of a bundled payment model for maternity care financed or pregnancy care financed by Medicaid. And um, it, it then will require to appropriately compensate for collaborative, comprehensive uh, care. And her example that she included was just one that there are times uh, where maternal fetal medicine uh, care is involved during a pregnancy and general OBGYN physician care as well, but that uh, a midwife can attend a delivery and that postpartum doula service can be incredibly helpful. So it's just, uh, I think, recognizing that a, a team approach <clears throat> that's probably facilitated by bundled payment um, the last line too, I, I've been thinking about a little bit more. Uh, uh, she did have a suggestion about the facilitation of information sharing. And I think we can just maybe reword this sentence to suggest that the Office of the National Coordinator for uh, Health Information, um, that, that we, I mean, I, I can craft something and maybe um, present it to, to the group a little bit later, but just a sentence that, that recommends that the Office of the National Coordinator have uh, be, be part of the description um, and implementation of pilots for bundled payment for maternity care. Does Excellent. anyone have any comments or questions about that? Uh, you can see this is Magda that um, uh, the language I suggest is not only facilitate but encourage. And this is this is a data related recommendation for interoperability. So there's, it's um, uh, the information sharing piece is um, there may need to be some incentives, um, and maybe that's implied in incentives. But um, I, I just think that that folks won't do it unless uh, it's more than um, facilitate it. As you wish to work the language. Sure, I, I will. And, and noting as well, a comment from Lisa Satterfield uh, from ACOG, um, uh, suggesting the use of alternative payment models. Um, I think the, re the reason uh, for the use of bundled payment is because in the um, Learning Action Network and other entities, Catalyst for Payment Reform, I mean, this isn't some new idea that for maternity care that, that uh, only a few have come up with. This is something that's been pushed on for probably a decade. And um, there are levels of alternative payment models. And some of them are as simple as, you know, we'll pay you a little bit more if you ask about smoking, <laughs> all the way to there should be a different way to pay for the entire package of care. And um, I think this is kind of like a, a level four. This is like the ultimate in alternative payment models. So um, <laughs> I, I would say the bundled payment part of it is is something that is, it's, it's being promoted by within the federal government. Some state governments are doing it and a lot of other entities. Any other comments? Jeannie. Yeah, this is Jeannie, I've got my hand up. Yeah, I also would urge using alternative met, um, payment models. Um, I come from a very alternative payment model with which is a managed care approach, which has, clearly collaborative, comprehensive perinatal care and a system. And that's to me an alternative model of care. I believe that we need the data specifically looking at maternity care, maternity outcomes and challenging us to come up with these other models of care. And a bundled approach is one of them, but certainly there are others that are equally valuable with very strong outcomes data. I, I concur with that, yes. All right, any other comments? So Steve, if you could sort of work on that, we can come back to that, you know, this afternoon or early later when we when we get to finalizing these things. Sure. All right, and then Janelle, let's talk about number 13. I know you were engaged with this. Un unmute yourself. Better? Yeah, okay. there you go. <laughs> All right, um, this, uh, this 
derive from the last sort of three-person health equity meeting group that happened a little bit spontaneously with short notice, um, where I brought up that we have discussed before in the health service. And I believe, um, I'm trying to think of who in particular of an invited speaker. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was Arthur James or maybe it, maybe it was around that time. But we briefly talked about Indian Health Service, and for the most part, uh, we haven't heard recently from an expert on Indian from Indian Health Service or on Indian Health Service um, issues. But it is a long-standing fact and documented in a recent report um, where Indian Health Service has been chronically underfunded. And if we're trying to improve the health of indigenous women, this is definitely one direct way we can do that by increased funding to their to Indian women and their families. So um, this comes out from just a request to immediately increase funding to Indian Health Service in accordance with historical trust obligations. So this is um, agreements that have been agreements historically between sovereign tribes and the US government, a nation to nation relationship, where in exchange for giving up our land and resources, um, we have um, rights to particular um, things, including um, healthcare. So um, some from the report, I believe that I shared the 2018 report, some of the recommendations included um, increasing funding specifically to urban Indian health centers, support job training programs to address staff shortages, um, increase preventative services, increase culturally and linguistically concordant maternal and infant health workforce. That in, was in addition to what we have been working on largely through SACEM and provide funding to upgrade Indian health service buildings and infrastructures to meet the needs of tribal communities. Um, in the report from 2018, um, I, I'm just kind of paraphrasing what I think um, I recall, but many of the facilities that Indian Health Service uses are 40 plus years old. And um, uh, when I shared this recommendation with some colleagues that are more familiar with Indian Health Service, um, they definitely wanted a measure part. You know, um, we're gonna improve maternal intimate health compared to what? So um, this health equity achieved by measuring the parity in maternal infant and child health outcomes to white women. Are there any thoughts or questions about this? My, my question is, this is a huge issue. Uh, and I don't think we have really dedicated enough time. There's two, two approaches that we could do. Try to, try to craft something in this recommendation or actually make part of our next meeting or the meeting after that, that focus on, on healthcare to Indians, particularly through the Indian Health Service. And so we have a much more uh, focused discussion and broader discussion so that we can come up with a more uh, referenced recommendation. Uh, that would be, you know, two approaches. We'll try to do something here or actually set aside some time in one of our SACA meetings to, to really focus on this issue because it's an important issue. Uh, Magda. Um, Janelle, thank you. And thanks to Dr. Warney and others who've been my um, teachers and mentors um, in learning and respecting. Um, I wanted to go back to something I said yesterday about in, in the recommendations we make, um, barring from Mark Friedman's model, what has data power, communication power, and proxy power to be able to inform policy that you know, it goes back to Ed's quote in the very beginning of yesterday from Abraham Lincoln about will. And so I'm wondering um, about a hybrid. Uh, Ed's approach definitely, but kicking cans down the road has been done a long time. So I'm feeling um, um, reluctant to, uh, yeah, we'll pay it forward. So towards that end, uh, I'm wondering about um, how to make the case here that within the Indian Health Service, if we were to advocate or promote a recommendation to adequately fund maternal, you know, pre-pregnancy, maternal maternity care and through the first year following delivery, 
in the Indian Health Service. Anchor it on that specific to our mandate. Then it would be a proxy in my, my um, hope, assumption, and I believe it's supported that as you invest in women and infants, so will you improve the broader system and better outcomes. So I'm wondering about how to take this large global recommendation, um, specify it uh, to um, uh, the uh, our, our charge, which is addressing infant and maternal mortality with the understanding that if we do that, we are impacting the rest of the Indian Health Service funding, potentially, if we take a life course approach. And the language you've offered here can then be put some of it into the, into the background document. So that's an alternative approach to do something now and do more later. Um, I, I totally, um, I understand what you're uh, advocating for Magda and I appreciate that. Um, I do, I guess I would like to make sure that uh, we continue to discuss this issue. Um, and I see some comments um, finding their way through and I admit that I am not an expert on Indian Health Service. I received care from Indian Health Service. I can share a lot about that, but I do not directly understand how it works or how it's funded. Um, and I did not, I'm not aware of funding going directly through states versus directly to Indian Health Service. Um, so I do like the idea of uh, making a specific recommendation targeting maternal infant health with regards to Indian Health Service funding. Um, and I see um, um, Susan's um, uh, comment about transportation. I mean, a lot of most tribes that are funded or served by Indian Health Service are rural. So the transportation is going to be a big issue, I get that. So as long as we can carve out a good amount of time to really discuss this issue for the future, Ed, um, I would agree to retracting the global request for um, immediate increased global funding to Indian Health Service in exchange for specific targeted funding for maternal infant health with the understanding that we would have a more dedicated um, discussion later. I, I, I like that approach and let's let's yeah. plan on that. Let's, let's have a more targeted recommendation so that we have it on the board that we're making some recommendation related to uh, Indian health and then we'll set it up as part of the agenda for the upcoming meeting. Okay. Right. Um, so uh, if Vanessa's typing things, um, what would what would we type in this area? Um, Let, let's, let's work let's let's work on okay. that sort of offline here and because uh, we want I want to get to a couple of other things before okay. we break for the the 1 p.m. session. All right, so let's go down to um, workforce. working faster than Vanessa can type. Um, and th this is one where um, actually we had two recommendations. One was related to community workforce and then the perinatal workforce. And they seem, they, they use the same words and I tried to put them together so that, that, I mean, it gets to be a little clunky but it was it was merging two of those. So yes. expand, uh, diversify sort of the, the community focus and then also the perinatal workforce. So th this is the new wording that, that came out and it, it could be certainly improved. Those of you who've been working on that, um, any suggestions or does it make sense? Mark, do you have your hand up or is that just not taken down from previously? All right. I'm not hearing any comments on that. We can certainly come back to that a little bit later because it is, uh, 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 and I'll take actually another look at it myself. Uh, let's go down to um, one that, the number three it was a new one that, that came in last night equitable funding among care providers.
I think this came in from the health equity group. Yeah, this again was um, Trent, a little bit jumping off from also yesterday's conversation with one of the um, one of the recommendations from um, Steve's group where there seemed to be like two recommendations in one. And so this was to address the, um, the equitable kind of pay for the same amount of work. Um, and it was trying to get at the, the means of Medicaid reimbursing for equal work done among physicians, you know, probably physicians assistants and midwives or um, nurse practitioners related to um, perinatal care. Um, so if it was antenatal care, postpartum care, or a birth delivery, um, that, that it would be reimbursed at the same rate. Lots of people. S same rate is different than um, yeah. equal. Sorry, so? So equitable and equal are different terms. Mm -hmm. I would support mm -hmm. equitable. Okay. Any other thoughts? I guess I would add to this that it would be support Medicaid to equitably fund midwives and other allied health um, service providers. Just acknowledging that it's more than just midwives, it's including other advanced practice nurses and physicians assistants. Mm -hmm. All right, and let's do one more. <clears throat> let's move on to number six before we, we break for our second session. This was one related to doulas. It says Hersh should work with CMS and state Medicaid programs to identify ways to adequately and sustainably fund the work of doulas and community health workers. It adds community health workers to this conversation. <clears throat> And then there is a parenthetical clause here explaining some of the reports and historical recommendations supporting that kind of an approach uh, and linking it to essential benefits. I'd be interested in hearing Belinda's perspective on this since, since you weren't here yesterday, Belinda, I, I know you have a lot of experience with it. <laughs> no, I was reviewing it, Steve, and I, I agree with this actual language here. I'm fine with this language because I think it's important um, at multiple fronts, but I think it's important to make sure that people view them as part of the care team, but also making sure that they are appropriately, you know, reimbursed for their time and their services and people understand the importance of that. So I am good with this recommendation. So do I. I think this does move the ball forward a little bit is what I've been really trying to do. Just move the, the whole community health worker and do a little workforce forward. So this this finds ways to do that. Any other comments on this? Um, one quickie, sorry. I, I would, I, the notion of funding versus reimbursement or remuneration, I just want us to tag that language because um, uh, funding may be seen as discretionary and reimbursement and or remuneration may be part of payment. And I just want us to harmonize that language. Yeah, I'm, I always think about financing it. it you know, how, how do we, how, how do, as Jeannie pointed out, there's multiple ways to pay things. There are multiple ways and, and we want to find a generic term to make sure that we have sustainable right. funding, sustainable resources, sustainable financing. Right. Uh, so, and so, so, yeah, sustainably remunerate is, as a, uh, funding may just be discretionary. That can be come and go. It really is about payment for uh, services provided and, we can talk more about that language, but there's nuance there that may have an inference of control and power. And I want us to be thoughtful about that. All right, very good. All right, all right. So we have a few more to go through, but we won't do that now because we have a session that we have planned for right now that I think we really, uh, which will help inform some of our conversations. Um, certainly over the last couple of months, uh, we have seen some reports and some plans uh, and some statements come forward first by, I'm not first, but by the, an organ, the a consortium of uh, maternal and child health organizations putting together a statement on racism. 
And then the AMA put together a report on, on their strategic plan around health equity. And then the Aspen uh, Health Strategies Group uh, put out a report just within the last month on, on maternity care and raised the whole issue of racism, with a, particularly with a couple of, of uh, important articles as part of that report. So we have three, we have representatives from each of those efforts uh, and that's gonna take over our, 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 shape our discussion over the next 45 minutes. And I've asked Janelle uh, Palacios who uh, chairs our health equity work group along with Belinda Pettiford to, to lead this discussion, facilitate this discussion. So Janelle, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ed. It is my pleasure to introduce the next panel of invited speakers. I have worked closely with my colleague and co-chair of the Health Equity Work Group, Belinda Pettifor. Um, Belinda's partnership and leadership has elevated the work of Health Equity Work Group and has produced um, much of what we have discussed today and we are so happy to have you invited speakers. I want to publicly thank you, Belinda, for your guidance and partnership in this. This next issue, is one I am both familiar with and have personal experience with. I am a white passing in some realms, but at home in my community, I am identified and othered as Indian. My reservation in Northwest Montana is home to my ancestors among the Salits and Tukhutni tribes. And growing up, I saw the effects and responses of nearly 600 years of systematic colonization and assimilation on my family and community take form in poor physical and mental health, self-medication to forget our pain through alcohol and substance use, and violence as a reaction to the intergenerational grief that we have not been able to work through. Today, black and indigenous women and infants are dying between three to five times that the rate of white women and infants in our shared nation. Black and brown men, women and children are incarcerated at higher rates than white men, women and children. Housing and food insecurity affect black and brown families at higher rates than our white neighboring families. Black and brown people are higher risk of living in areas greatly impacted by environmental assaults. For decades, the mm -hmm. onus of our deficits and poor outcomes were laid upon our shoulders, not the policies and institutions that have created the conditions from which we lived and tried to survive. Structural racism, is now a term that is safe to say. Think on that. Not too long ago, those doing this work spoke in code to describe this lived experience. Mounting evidence has finally identified in scientific terms what many people of color live day to day. SACOM has purposely centered our work around equity and have identified structural racism as the major reason for our inequities and disparities in maternal and infant health outcomes. Our SACOM briefing books and past briefing books have cited numerous studies addressing racism's insidious effects onto health and um, well being. Given we SACOM committee members are all on this shared understanding on structural racism related to health outcomes, we look to our invited panel to share their vision of how SACOM can move forward to address these grave disparities. We are at a time for growth. Growth as a nation, this work is difficult. And as my colleague and friend, Linda Pettifor likes to say, just because it's hard to do does not mean it should not be done. The first panel I will introduce is from our consortium of maternal child health organizations whose guidance will influ influence the guides and policies uh, and programs. I am happy to introduce Dr. Arthur James, member Franklin County Board of Health and for former SACOM member, Jonathan Webb, CEO and Association of uh, Women's Health Obstetrics and Neonatal Nurses, um, Scott Burns, President and CEO of the National Institute of Children's Health Equity, sorry, Health Equality, Denise Pecha, De Deputy Executive Director, Director of City Match, and Deborah Frazier, CEO, National Healthy Start Association. And finally, Caroline Stample, Interim CEO, Chief Strategy and Program Officer from the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs. Welcome.
I would like, uh, you are welcome to start presenting. Um, Dr. James or Arthur James, are you presenting first? Yes, yes, thank you very much. And thank you for that very powerful introduction to this section of the meeting. On behalf of the <clears throat> collaborative uh, that we'll be presenting initially, I'd like to thank SACM for inviting us to today's meeting. <clears throat> As someone who is not a president or CEO of the national organization, I also wanna express my sincere appreciation to those of this group who are presidents and CEOs for allowing me to the honor of beginning this session. 20 years ago, the Genome Project <clears throat> proved that we are 99.9% .9 the same. We no longer believe that our physiologic racial differences account for the centuries long inequities in birth outcomes. How our country has managed the issue of race is the biggest contributor to these disparities. We also acknowledge that <clears throat> the persistence of these inequities represents the most troublesome and complex challenge facing maternal child health. During January of 2013, SACM stated, our ability to prevent infant deaths and to address longstanding disparities is a barometer of our society's commitment to the health and well-being of all women, children, and families. Yet today, as was stated by Janelle, African-American and Native American mothers and babies continue to die at three to five times the rate of whites. It is our hope that this bold collaboration of AMCHIP, City Match, the National Healthy Start Association, and NICHQ will empower all of us to take the necessary steps to face this challenge and thereby begin the hard work of eliminating race-based differences in the opportunity for mothers and babies to survive pregnancy, childbirth, and the first year of life. I now turn it over to Jonathan Webb. Thank you, Dr. James. Thanks so much for that framing um, and for all of your efforts in moving this work forward. Uh, you've truly been a catalyst for this work and so instrumental uh, bringing this to fruition. Uh, it's exciting to see how this has evolved since our first conversation about this type of work in this joint effort more than a year ago. Um, as, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm Jonathan Webb, the current CEO for A1 and former CEO for AMSHIP. Uh, as a brief history, when this concept was first discussed, we were interested in bringing together leading public health organizations to not only identify racism as a public health crisis, but to commit to actionable items that we could collectively hold ourselves accountable to and thus lead by example. We discussed reaching out to a large number of organizations in this effort, but ultimately landed on a, a handful of key organizations to begin with, um, uh, AMCHIP, NICHQ, City Match. Uh, National Healthy Start Association, uh, ASTO, NATO, and March of Dimes. Um, in fact, you may remember these organizations jointly presented um, our intentions to SACM last year. As you may have noticed, we have lost a few organizations along the way. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, we, we knew this effort would be challenging and we've learned firsthand how difficult this work is, but we have thankfully learned a lot in the process that will benefit us as we move this work forward with those who have uh, the, the, with those who've had to sit this out, this round out, um, and for those that will engage in the future. Um, a few quick notes on how this work has evolved and what we've learned. So from an evolution standpoint, um, our statement addresses multiple areas of focus. And over the life of our conversations drafting this document, we decided that commitment to this should be all in, meaning that although we acknowledged it would take time to comply with everything, the expectation was that you would eventually comply with all these areas of the state. We asked organizations to be all in, in their efforts to being anti-racist. Uh, the second area for evolution was that we started focusing on action, not optics or statements. Uh, we finally agreed this document will be a declaration um, outlining items to which we and others could be held accountable. A few of the things we've learned, one, there are many well-meaning organizations doing this work and leading in this work, but even in those cases, there must be a thoughtful approach to navigating the politics of leadership and our various memberships, um, even if there is general agreement on a final destination. The second item we learned was that the devil's in the details. Um, even organizations who are leading in this space must be mindful of the financial and resource implications of committing to an effort like this, and the timing of this must fit into the strategic process within each organization. The all-in, the third thing we learned was that the all-in commitment required um, was challenging for some. 
because it would commit them in advance to actions items that would normally require more board and leadership involvement. So in that vein, we learned that board and leadership commitment to this is essential. Uh, additionally, a number of organizations shared that the, for future consideration, we may wanna consider a tiered commitment process that would allow more uh, to participate and build over time. Um, this is something we, we might consider down the line, but for now, we wanted people to be all in. We will learn and reassess over time how this, this effort turns, turns out, but for now, wanted to stick with the all in approach to avoid the possibility of diluting our efforts. Lastly, uh, we learned that all the organizations are committed to this work. And even though they weren't able to sign on this time, there is still interest in partnering on efforts around this and the door was left open for, uh, for sign on. Um, even for my new organization, once the organizational processes and policies have been navigated. Um, I'm so thankful for this work and to begin and look forward to bringing those who started with us along but couldn't sign on this time back into the fold. Um, the all in declaration in the near future, as well as the new partners like my organization, A1, and others in the, in the provider space. I'm thankful that we've had a chance to, to start this work and I'm looking forward to continuing with new partners as we engage. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Scott Burns from NICHQ to dig a bit deeper into our first joint commitment statement. Thanks, Jonathan. We're gonna transition into the three uh, commitment areas. Next slide. Our first joint commitment focuses on internal processes, which are a foundational part of this action plan. Similar to how change must begin within ourselves as individuals, the critical organizational systems change we are talking about today must begin within each organization's core, the processes and policies that shape our behaviors and actions. Commitments in this section include ongoing training of all staff in undoing racism, assessing skill in racial equity, health equity, and social justice when hiring new staff, as well as in performance evaluations, analyzing and setting metrics for diversity in our service vendors and subject matter experts, auditing our internal practices and policies with a racial equity lens, examining and intervening in the racial and ethnic makeup of our staff and boards with a focus on retention and annually assessing our organizational culture of inclusion. At NICHQ, our ongoing internal uh, racial equity work is supported by monthly all staff equity in services that feature subject matter experts and small group discussions. Although we've been working as a remote team for more than a year now, these conversations have continued and deepened as we witness and experience complex issues like racism collide with critical current events, including the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020, we initiated an annual assessment of NICHQ staff understanding around implicit bias and health equity. In 2021, we established a measurable goal on staff perception of their ability to impact equity. This section of the joint commitment can be leveraged by SACOM and our partner MCH organizations as a starting point to meaningfully examine their internal processes and policies and the way those policies affect the experiences of their staff and those they engage with professionally. I now turn it over to Denise Pecker from CityMatch to discuss our second commitment. Denise. Thanks, Scott. Next slide, okay, thank you. Our second joint commitment focuses on external work and includes the following commitments. To examine local, state, and federal policies for impact on equity and advocate against those that perpetuate inequity and racial disadvantage. Promote life course theory. Partner with impacted communities and organizations. Ensure contractual awards, processes, and decision-making practices are inclusive, accessible, transparent, and support equitable access to resources. Work with social movements towards creating alliances and integration with MCH and other social systems and encourage our members to understand the racial histories of our nation, their states, counties, and cities, and the impact on racial inequities and health outcomes. At City Match, in addition to our internal racial equity work, we are currently establishing goals to measure our progress on these external commitments. We also have resources available for folks working in some of these areas. One of the practices City Match is doing includes honoring indigenous presence and land rights by offering land acknowledgements. I am in Omaha, Nebraska, the ancestral home of the Omaha and Sioux people. SACOM and our partner MCH organizations are encouraged to engage in any of these practices. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to Deborah Frazier from National Healthy Start Association for Commitment 3.
Deborah, you may be. Thank on. you. Thank you, Denise. Um, our third commitment begins with the acknowledgement that racism is a public health crisis. This effort has been deliberate in stating that this crisis requires a remedy and a bold action and communication plan that addresses the contributions to racism. A big part of this effort um, is honest communication and conversation about our use of language, language that demeans and disparages populations and communities and ultimately perpetuates racism. We also encourage examination and honest communication about our policies, as well as our own bias and privilege that contributes to racism. And while undoing racism may not be comfortable conversations, creating safe places for these critical and necessary communications demonstrates respect for each other and for the communities and the people we serve. And our hope is that these candid dialogues result in the ultimate and the long overdue goal mentioned by Dr. James to eliminate race-based disparities in this country. At National Healthy Start Association, we've learned to grow and to learn from the diversity of our Healthy Start communities that represent BIPOC communities and a range of geographic areas in urban, rural, tribal, and Appalachian communities. Their voices guide and drive our work and serve as a community barometer for the impact of racism and disparities that range from birth outcomes to the disparate impact of COVID and social determinants and the impact on our fathers and the health of men. Our internal and external communications reflect our relationship and commitment to these communities. And we know that words and language are important and that people and communities are not defined by health outcomes. These are rich, diverse communities, and in keeping with this communications commitment, we encourage population and community descriptions and language that is respectful, culturally appropriate, and, ex and include the examination of systems of care that are lacking, underserved, or have failed these communities. We're all in this effort to end racism and disparities, and this group would like to leverage our efforts with those of SACM to encourage ourselves and others to use respectful communication internally and externally, and to begin honest communication regarding racism. And Carolyn from AMCHIP will provide our final remarks in this group. Thank you, Deborah. The four organizations will be meeting regularly. One of our first goals is to identify measures of accountability that we can track, and the goal is to track quarterly. Each organization already has some accomplishments to share and you've heard some of them. And for example, at AMCHIP, we've initiated staff training around racism as a root cause of inequity and declared racism as a public health crisis. We plan to share best practices around the actions we've already taken and obstacles that we've overcome. The strength of doing this work together comes from honestly sharing our challenges and assisting each other with solutions. So we're committed to moving forward together, even when it means stumbling together. We believe SACOM and other MCH organizations will be interested in the measures that we identify. And for those of us with memberships, sharing our progress on those measures with our constituents as part of that accountability. We also realize some organizations may be interested in joining the commitment and we're open to having people join and be all in. And we're open to additional asks from this committee and we thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I uh, really appreciate the, the catchphrase all in because that's what it's going to take. And I love that um, education about our history, our nation's history as a part of that because back when um, Ed first shared his thoughts on what would be the hand washing of, you know, the previous century that would help improve health so much. And I believe the, the hand washing of today is actually educating our nation and this truth about our nation's history as a place to start. Thank you for that. All right, the next panel speaker I am happy to introduce is Dr. Alita Maybank, Chief Health and Equity Officer and Senior Vice President at the American Medical Association and leading much of the work done on racism and its effects on health please. I am so happy to welcome you, Dr. Maybank. Thank you. Uh, really a pleasure to be here um, and a pleasure to be in community with uh, many of you and seeing some familiar old faces or older people I knew in the past, I should say, 
Um, just really appreciate being a community and community with National Healthy Start as well. I was very much engaged in that work when I was um, deputy commissioner in the New York City Department of Health um, and, and really overseeing Brooklyn and the work we did there. So um, I am going to share just a, a few um, slides as well. So hopefully I'm able to, I have permission to share my screen if that's at all possible. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I have now been at the American Medical Association for about um, two years. Um, it, for those who don't know of the AMA, um, it's a physician organization. It's been around since 1847, um, representing physicians predominantly, however, um, known to have larger influence um, as it relates to the healthcare system. Um, our mission is inclusive of public health as well, and I've been um, working my best to leverage um, that opportunity and reality around uh, public health. Um, and so my task coming on board two years ago as being their inaugural chief health equity officer was to really figure out how to facilitate a process to embed equity um, throughout the entire organization. There's a management team of 1,100 folks. There are the members, 270,000. Um, physicians, and then there's the medical community um, at large, again, um, understanding their intersections with public health. And so, um, you know, spent two years of learning the culture. I've been in governmental public health most of my career um, and kind of learning the culture of medicine and healthcare, um, where the gaps are and where the opportunities are within the space of medicine, but then more specifically within AMA. COVID came around um, and as we all know, exposed the inequities that have been existing in our country since the beginning of time here. Um, and also then the public murder of George Floyd um, propelled our national um, reckoning or conversation around racism and naming racism. And so AMA was not immune from that. And um, definitely for many of us who have been leading this work um, for, for a while and people even before my time, um, it was an opportunity and an opportunity that definitely needed to be um, seized um, and especially from, I, from my perspective, the healthcare um, community. And so during the summer, our board of trustees um, did leverage that and put forward a statement um, to name racism <clears throat> as a public health threat um, and that AMA would do whatever we would, could do to actively dismantle these policies um, uh, and practices, discriminatory policies and practices um, across healthcare. To formalize it though, um, our House of Delegates um, did pass policy and formal policy in the fall of this past year to formally name racism as a public health threat to also rid our healthcare system of racial essentialism, which I think is actually the more forward um, leaning parts of the policies. Um, it, it moved it beyond just the, the declaration of racism as a public health threat but it actually started to speak more towards action. And then supporting the elimination of race as a proxy for ancestry, genetics, and biology in med ed research and clinical practice. And this is gonna have tremendous impacts um, across um, our space of healthcare. So these policies provided this open door really for myself, my team, and many others across the AMA to be much more bold um, and much more direct and forthcoming. And I feel like where we needed to be as AMA and the medical community to this work of undoing um, racism and anti-racism work. Um, but we had to really push ourselves, you know, to, to make sure as was already mentioned, how are we gonna move beyond the declaration and really <clears throat> do the action of it? So we released our strategic plan um, about a month ago, two, almost two months ago now. Um, and it definitely generated a lot of attention and I'll come to that in, in one second. Um, but this was a plan, it's a long plan, intentionally long, 80 pages long, but I felt it was really important that we took the time to educate and bring folks along because it was clear, um, especially in the healthcare community that not everybody really understood these terms, valued these terms, just really did get it and really weren't fully embracing it. And so I did want to put a document forward in which we name strategies and folks are just really completely clueless to where these strategies are coming from. And so a good part of the document actually has a primer um, to help support um, education and, and building some level of a shared analysis so that when people got to the strategies, we would have some level of communication that was hopefully 
hopefully aligned, um, but we know there are challenges to, to that fully being accomplished. But overall, you see the statement here in terms of our vision. Um, and you know, we are very explicit in using terms beyond just even dismantling racism, but talking about white supremacy and dismantling white supremacy as a system and also the, the, under, the, the undermining of that system um, and how it impacts and uh, undermines uh, health equity. Um, we have theories of change that we wanted to put forward. We think um, in order to make sure that we are kind of all aligned with the same values and strategies, um, and I just speak to the left that this is to really talk about writing the injustices of our past. Um, somebody mentioned already about the narratives and the importance of narratives and, and deconstructing narratives that are malignant um, and pervasive, um, centering the voices and ideas um, and experiences and people of those who have been most marginalized in any space, making sure that we lead with race and racism, um, but have an intersectional approach as well. Um, embracing public health frameworks of health and acting upstream. That's really important from the medical context. You all are kind of in the public health space. And then implementing the inside outside strategy for organizational transformation, which was brought up in the previous presentation as well. So what it's really, I think, powerful, what I'm seeing now is a lot of alignment. You know, I've been doing the inside outside work for the past 14 years or 15 years now. And usually it was focused on doing external work, how folks were engaging with community. But what's really powerful is that now I'm seeing this really intentional effort to focus on embedding internal to the organization. Um, and I wouldn't add anything different to some of the, the slides that was that were just shown. But we have to also be explicit about like how we're building alliances. We want to be explicit about innovation, pushing upstream. And then lastly, I think um, two points lastly. The one part that I do think is really missing from the internal conversation often is the need to build in trauma-informed supports and systems, even for your staff and teams, um, as you move through this work. This it naturally, it, you know, there is already trauma that's existing. There's the opportunity to re-traumatize folks, the opportunity for conflict, and it's it's creating spaces absolutely. But what, how do we? How does that become a system? And, and supported in the culture of doing this transformational work at the organizational level is really important. And then lastly, I'll say, I don't believe any institution can really move forward with anti-racism work unless they look at their own past. And many folks are very well aware of uh, AMA's um, history. The document that we did um, release has so, uh, several pages of some of the harms that we have caused as the American Medical Association and so we need to really be explicit and intentional about fostering pathways for truth, um, racial healing and reconciliation um, for our past. And there are many ways that we need to go about doing that, quantifying and qualifying those harms um, and figuring out what we're going to do to repair them. And I think that's in line with conversations at the federal level. It's work that other countries have started to do, um, but um, I think we, it's time in medicine and, and we kind of start from that point. Um, uh, of really leading this work of equity. And I just always end with this slide because oftentimes in doing this work, you know, I hear so much um, hyper intellectualization of harm um, and just really reframing and reminding people that this is about people um, and, and, and bodies and hearts and spirits and, and um, always just keeping the focus on that because I think sometimes in these conversations we get caught up in um, the academic aspects of this work. Not, and I use we in the in a very loose term and I don't mean to do that, but many folks who are in positions of leadership um, and many physicians tend to do that. So that is it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maybank for that. Um, I was really um, happy to see the trauma-informed care as part of the healing process because it is, um, as a clinician, um, I see this as part of my everyday work where I'm working with people who have been traumatized and how to engage caringly or dare I say lovingly to another human. And that is the work we're doing. We're doing human work, right? Mm -hmm. To see each other as humans. And often the most difficult work is looking in the mirror and seeing what you and your history has has done. So it's our nation's facing its history and looking at the mirror is a very hard step, but work that is much needed. 
The next person I would love to um, invite to speak is our invited speaker. Um, she is the co-chair of the Aspen Health Strategy Group, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you now the former governor of Kansas, who then went on to become the 21st secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Secretary Sebelius, the Zoom floor is yours. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, I'm delighted to join uh, the advisory group in this important discussion. And I wanted to just, um, first of all, recognize that uh, many of you uh, are regular providers and experts in this area. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of our discussions, but to make it very clear, the Aspen Health Strategy Group is, um, as this slide indicates, a group of uh, about 22 people who come together representing uh, payers, providers, advocates, uh, policymakers. Uh, and what we do is choose and tackle a single issue, uh, focus on that issue for uh, deliberations, and then try to come up with what we identify as sort of five big ideas. And we do not represent organizations. We do not have um, the kind of you know, uh, deliberation and discussion that uh, has been discussed already, which is so critical, uh, unpacking racism and re-examining organizational efforts. But I think what um, led to this inter, uh, invitation was our focus for 2020, which was on um, maternal mortality and the health crisis of maternal mortality, which directly uh, involves uh, what we feel is a, a deep strain of racism that has run through this medical practice and uh, continues to present as a, a huge health crisis that unfortunately uh, is too long in being called out in America. Um, I must share my own chagrin uh, that in my term as secretary, while we focused on a lot of issues and equity issues and disparity issues, uh, this was one that did not have the drumbeat it should. And if Black Lives Matter, if we really believe that uh, we need to tackle um, systemic racism, it starts by having uh, particularly Black mothers and their babies live in the United States of America and uh, Native American mothers are second in line for mortality rates that are really shocking in the United States of America. We're the only country that um, since 1987, our mortality rates have increased. And for every death, uh, we see about 100 incidents of severe morbidity. So the deaths are just the tip of the iceberg um, in what should be a very natural uh, process. So I'm just gonna, if we could go to the next slide, focus on a couple of the um, areas that we talked about, because I think while many of you have an opportunity and are doing a deep dive into kind of organizational looks an effort at um, confronting uh, racist practices and a racist history. I think this is a, an example of the kind of specific issue which can be um, impacted by not only a, a recognition of what has brought us to this point, but a real call to um, use all the tools in the toolbox. Uh, the federal government can play a huge role uh, the legislative branches can play a huge role. States can, um, insurers, uh, providers, and this is really a all hands on deck effort. So, you know, the first issue really is just a national commitment at all levels of government and the private sector. It has to be a public private partnership that really calls out maternal mortality as the the health crisis, but really the, the racial disparities in maternal mortality where a black woman is less safe giving birth in Texas than she is in many developing countries. And um, we have a situation where 
Uh, black mothers are four times as likely to die as, as non-Hispanic white women. And that's just a totally unacceptable uh, situation to be in. Um, so it's everything from revisiting the 2030 uh, goals uh, for healthy America, where there are some modest increases suggested uh, for the next nine years, not nearly sufficient enough to take on this idea and not nearly ambitious enough. Um, I think the uh, notion that we use CMMI, the uh, research and development arm of uh, CMS and particularly in the Medicaid area to look at what has worked. California has some models which are marginally successful. Almost no other state has done that kind of work, but uh, drive really some improvements in this area and begin to really collect data and measure it and call it out. Um, I think one of the big missing pieces is that um, we have not announced this loudly enough. And when I share data with people outside of this discussion about what happens to pregnant women in this country, and what happens particularly if you're black or brown and pregnant in this country, folks are shocked, but it is not a well-known fact. And it is something that I think deserves a real highlight and focus as we look at broadly Structural racism, this is a, uh, an example, unfortunately, of that in practice. Um, the issue about supporting and building community care models really is about recognizing what has happened in this area of giving birth in America. And it, it really is the hospitalization of birth and driving, frankly, out of business, what were a very successful group of Black midwives who operated and practice across the South. And when uh, the shift occurred to urge women, to uh, encourage women and to change the payment system so women went to hospitals, that began to change. And um, it is now recognized that for lots and lots of people, uh, giving birth is a very low risk um, endeavor and should be in a community and culturally appropriate setting and should be with providers who uh, the patients and, and in this case, the birthing mother chooses to be an attendant. But that includes not only lifting up those models and making sure that they are paid for and encouraged, but also looking at what CMS will pay for, what Medicaid pays for in terms of midwifery, how we're training people, what the um, issues are. I'm impressed that this group is an advisory group to the secretary and I can tell you as a secretary, I took these recommendations very seriously from advisory groups. So I would not um, shy away from making very specific recommendations to the secretary uh, around issues that um, you take on. Um, insurance, and in one of my former lives, I was an insurance commissioner for a number of years. Insurance uh, is really not designed around women's needs. Health plans uh, for a lot of years included uh, Viagra, not contraception. Uh, but one of the things, if you look at where a woman becomes Medicaid eligible, mandatorily eligible, it's when she is pregnant and often that really doesn't put her necessarily in the best of health before she becomes pregnant. That's a big issue. Uh, Long-term contraception is really important in lots of situations for women who wanna space their children, who are not healthy enough to be pregnant, but often they don't qualify for insurance until they're pregnant. So having a discussion with Medicaid about that and also um, looking at the mandatory extension of Medicaid for the first year of a baby's life. So the woman, um, in too many cases, even if she has access to insurance and health coverage for a limited period of time while she's pregnant and for 60 days after she delivers a baby, that insurance disappears and is cut off in way too many states. So redesigning insurance around uh, whole women needs healthy in the first place uh, making sure that uh, she's taken care of. I think the, the racism uh, recommendations, which are many, 
deal with everything from uh, provider respect and uh, in retraining to listen to their patients, to listen to women. We have some great examples like Serena Williams, one of the most famous African-American women in our country who had a terrible time having her doctors pay any attention to her when she brought up issues around her pregnancy. And she nearly died giving birth to her daughter. And if she had a hard time getting attention, imagine the number of people who are just dismissed um, from the outset. That's a unfortunately a, a pretty regular part of women's care where over and over again in specialty areas, uh, women are listened to less than men, women's needs are paid attention to less than men, but it is amplified, I think, for women of color uh, where they are dealing in a system where their needs and their issues are just not uh, respected. We must do a better job in recruiting um, a diversity of providers. And again, uh, not just in doctors and OBGYNs, uh, but uh, looking at midwifery and doulas and healthcare workers who really can support this process and are paid for equitably and adequately, are licensed equitably and adequately, are um, respected and encouraged to become part of the solution to what is a health crisis. And then finally, I think really focusing on the research data and analysis. Again, the federal government is in a unique situation to really count uh, who is dying, who is suffering uh, when they try to give birth. We do not have a systematic way of counting. We don't have a way of analyzing it. CDC research uh, is desperately needed to set standards and set definitions. Uh, but this is an example of an area which has a huge impact on not just the women and their families uh, who end up in a situation um, of death or near death that could have lifetime impacts. It affects our community, it affects our country, and it is something that I think really deserves the bright spotlight, not just that the advisory committee has given, but along the way. The Aspen report relied on papers of experts, uh, which are really excellent. The entire report is available online um, and has some very specific recommendations, but I, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to at least highlight in one issue area that is um, really available for action and really available to make a huge difference. Um, the, the kind of uh, ideas that were generated out of our discussions last year. So thank you for including me. Thank you. Thank you, um, Secretary Sibelius, um, for sharing your five, the five big ideas from the Aspen Institute. Two issues struck with me the most, um, recognizing that communities know what is needed. And so partnering with communities and asking them what they need and giving them power to shape the tools needed to promote health um, has been elevated again through your report. And additionally, recognition that women's health directly affects our nation is reflective of our cultural view and practices through our policies and programs. Women are only valued when they are pregnant. That's the message I heard. And not before or after. And as an example, sanitary napkins and a needed aspect of women's and girls' health is still taxed as a luxury item in most states, while condoms and Viagra are not. The medical model, a model that privileges, privileges white men is used as the model of care for women but this model has not met the needs of pregnant women. So other models are needed. That is the next message I heard. So I see that with the allotted time for this session that we have um, with Ed's um, blessing, I would request that we carve out an additional 15 minutes for question and answer. Go ahead. Ed, Go ahead. Thank Go ahead. you. Thank you. The first, um, you know, in, in general, what we're looking for are, are the one to two recommendations um, each of you, from each of you representing the organizations that you do that SACM can, can take and move forward. Um, 
and then I will open up to any other um, I, questions that others may have. Maternal child health, uh, would anyone like to speak about one to two recommendations that we as they can, can take to the secretary? I think I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Carolyn who sort of summed up our, um, our recommendations and see if she can offer those for us, if you don't mind, Carolyn. Sure, absolutely. And Janelle, you started to touch on some of them and those, those come from some very concrete um, things that we've committed to across the internal, external and communication area. So um, recommending that federal agencies are partnering with impacted communities and organizations. That's a very powerful um, recommendation to listen to the people who are most impacted and to do that in a way that is um, giving power to their words and, and their needs, not, not just sharing, but giving, um, and to encourage through different opportunities and engagements, encouraging partner agencies and grantees to really truly pursue anti-racist commitments and actions. And through our, our commitments that we've made to each other, we've really emphasized not just a statement or a declaration, but a commitment that comes with measurement and accountability. And so we feel that those are extraordinarily important as we make recommendations. Um, I think in the internal processing, there's always work to do to say, how is it true about me or how is it true about my organization? So really meaningfully examining internal processes and policies and how those policies affect the experiences of the people who are doing the work. I think we recognize and I so appreciated the AMA um, approach to the trauma-informed process, not just for the people you are working with and serving, but the people who are doing the work as well. And um, I think the last thing I'll say is that we just know that we are out here um, doing this commitment, making this commitment together and role modeling. And that is something that the advisory committee most certainly could recommend that there are steps to be taken that will serve as a model for other agencies. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I see that Secretary Sibelius that you need to leave very soon, but is there anything that you can share with us that will help advance our work? Well, I would just um, urge the committee to uh, be as specific as possible and call out. Um, I think it's important to you know acknowledge that work will go on in the AMA and uh, other organizations, but I think for the secretary to call out what the tools are within HHS, what are the action items that he and the new team can take and make um, really are helpful because I, I just, there's a lot of incoming when you're in that office and 11 operating agencies and lots of things going on. So as really direct as the committee can be and as specific, you know, HRSA should do these, it would be helpful to do these five things. You know, we need midwife. I mean, what whatever it is that the committee comes to consensus on, I would make them very, very specific and tie it to, you know, what, what kind of difference it makes because it's just um, the more practical and sort of the less process because that can, you know, be acted on quickly. And I would just finally say this is a moment in time at least, you know, for this particular issue, you have um, Lauren Underwood, a member of Congress now, a black nurse who was in HHS uh, during the Obama administration, who is a leading champion of the mommy bus bill on the, in the house. You have Kamala Harris, who was her co-sponsor in the Senate side, who now happens to be the vice president of the United States. Um, you have a majority, you have an administration, I think, that is very eager to, you know, tackle some of these issues. So I would say this is a very unique moment, and it's kind of an all hands on deck. So coming out with congressional recommendations, HHS recommendations, some things at the state and local level, some things that, you know, the AMA can push through private providers. I mean, all of that, all of the above would be just extraordinarily helpful. And I think you're in a moment that won't fall on deaf ears. Well, I'm going to jump in as the chair and uh, Secretary Sebelius, I noticed, I was struck with the fact that all HHS secretaries were involved in this process. They were all That's part right. of the advisory committee. 
That's and, right. And you raise the issue that we need to raise the visibility of maternal mortality as an issue. And the fact that all of the previous HHS secretaries were involved in this, does, does that give us some leverage to say, let's do the narrative change that makes maternal health a priority? Also, AMA is doing the same thing as the leading medical care organization. How do we leverage this kind of power at this point in time to change that narrative and make this the center point of what we do as a country? Well, I think you asked the secretary to either have the Surgeon General or the secretary himself call it out as a public health crisis and use the bully pulpit of that office to say, this is unacceptable. It's been going on, you know, our, our rates have gone up since 1987. Uh, enough is enough. And, you know, there's a, a sort of structural racism at the heart of this. And if we're looking at health disparities and health equity, this is it. I mean, we're going to call this out as um, a crisis that we have the tools to solve. We have the knowledge how to solve it. And we just need to have the will. Um, and to remind you, and you all may know this, but Secretary Becerra's wife is a high-risk OBGYN. She yep. works on these issues on a regular basis. She knows a lot about high-risk moms and deaths. And so he is well-suited to be in a position to uh, act on this issue. And I think he listens to his wife. So, you know, what the hell? <laughs> As every wise man should. Thank you all for having me. And let me know if I can help. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. We have just mm -hmm. a few moments left. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Maybank. Um, is there anything additional that you would recommend that we can take to the secretary with regards to our, um, our aims? Uh, additional to, to what has been said, not much. Ed actually just took exactly the, the, my, the key point that I wanted to get across, but I just think about the sustainability of this beyond political administrations. Um, and most of us have worked in government and that's our challenge. And I think sustainability um, really ties closely to accountability and metrics, but it also ties closely to having enough resources and actual dollars and funding and money to do the work of the anti-racism work. I'm just gonna say that explicitly, that's connected to maternal mortality work. There are too many assumptions, I still see it to this day, um, of, of what it takes, and it takes a lot. And I have to really be thankful, honestly, to the AMA that has given the resources and all of AMA is in terms of their history. That's one thing that I can't, I, I, I can say that I have gotten the resources to do this work. Um, and the support and leadership to do this work that allows for an opportunity to think about sustainability. And then to that point of what Ed was bringing together, I think so many folks, and I learned this more through the release of the plan, are in this space of trying to figure out what to do as you all are. And there is an opportunity to create and create power in a way that we haven't had before. And I, I, it would be great for us to fully leverage that. So when I think about HHS and their ability to be connected to all those agencies, not only within HHS, but outside of HHS, how are they all coming together to help support kind of a long-term outcome of improved maternal mortality and closing of the gap of maternal mortality? Things we've heard before, but this is a time I think to fully really consider operationalizing it. You, Somebody mentioned it in their slides, the health and all policies kind of approach. You know, this is the time to do it. I think the door is open. We haven't had enough will in this country to do that. Um, and so I, I, I just think if we don't capitalize on it, I think we, we really lose the opportunity for sustainability um, and power of this work. Thank you, Dr. Maybank. It, it okay. goes back to identifying the problem, having the will, acting on it, and the sustaining it, definitely. And that is a, a huge issue, just knowing that times can change every few years. Yeah, um, I know that, um, Ed, that we are at our time right now at this moment, but um, is it possible just to ask if anyone has a burning question? Yeah, let's, let's take a couple of questions. We, we, can, we can go a little bit, a little bit longer. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? 
Magda has her hand up. Magda, please. Uh, profound gratitude to my colleagues for um, movement forward with tenacity um, and absolute unwillingness to compromise on what is core. So gratitude number one, with commitment to action. So words go to deed. Um, speaking of words, uh, Ed, you speak about and had a conversation just now about the importance of narrative. Um, Dr. Maybank, you spoke about the essential nature and challenge of changing the narrative. So two narrative related questions. Um, one is the language of public health threat, emergency crisis. And I was curious if um, you have uh, recommendations for what the leading language and most strategic and, and thoughtful language can be about urgency, because they're all speak to urgency. Without urgency, there is not change. Uh, and the second is the leading edge of now maternal mortality. And this is the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality in name with an expanded charter. How do we assure the alignment in the message of maternal mortality and severe morbidity and infant mortality and severe morbidity um, in the context of being an anti-racist organization? How do we harmonize that part as well? So urgency language and population language, what do you advise so that we are being crisp, clear, and compelling? Yeah, I, I can answer the first part and then if other the other group wants to answer the, the second part. Um, so in terms of you know, and, and Magda, it's good just to be in, in the same space with you. I haven't seen you in a, in a while, so good to it's see you. It's great to see you. Thank you, um, Lisa. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so I, you know, we use threat. Um, and I think from uh, the context of urgency, I think threat is true. I think crisis is true and it's immediate as well and creates a sense of urgency. What I shift to, though, and this is my, my challenge, honestly, and all of our challenge is that once we start naming things as a threat, and I think it's important for the urgency, but then we start to lose track of what's the vision of where we're trying to go. And, and, and what, are we, what are we working towards redesigning? What are we working towards deconstructing, decolonizing, redesigning, reimagining even before redesigning? Like we have to get to those parts as well. I think as soon as we start to name something as a threat, because when, because when you name something as a threat, the urgency happens, the funding happens, people come together, then it's not sustainable. Exactly, and so I think we have to be a little bit more prepared for when that opportunity does come. The Surgeon General does announce, you know, maternal mortality as a public health threat or crisis, and and you all are prepared in so many ways, you know, because you've been doing this work. But let's get that vision. I think together faster and, and have it ready as, as well. I think it's really important. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Dr. And, mm -hmm. Jonathan? Dr. Dr. Peck, good to be with you again as well. A pleasure, um, Jonathan. Um, I was just gonna build on to Dr. Maybank's comments and I'll turn it over to the rest of our group to see if they have anything to add, but I agree with everything that was offered. Um, I've used uh, threat uh, as well as crisis. Uh, I have trended more towards using crisis because threat um, to me gives the, the implication that something is on its way um, versus being in the moment now. We're in, in a crisis um, and, we ha and we have been in a crisis for a while. So the, 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 the thinking that we need to actually focus on where we are, it's not, it's not something that's coming, it's here that we're dealing with um, and, and, and using that as, a, as an impetus and some urgency to apply our operationalizing of efforts to make this um, more sustainable. And Magda, I'll just, I'll jump in on the second question, which is perhaps just, hi, just as challenging, if not more challenging. And I'll just um, give a relatively straightforward answer, which is that um, I think that, that the emphasis should be really be on the diet, right? When you think about, you know, maternal health, maternal morbidity, mortality is like, wow, look at, look at how poorly the U.S. is doing. And that's, that's a bit of a shock and a revelation 
but there's still lots and lots of babies, too many babies dying. And there are disparities in both, right? The disparities in maternal mortality line up with infant mortality pretty much. And so I think that part of what the, the advisory committee could do is, is to bring that dyadic approach that both are important, you know, show the data and then present what the actual items could, could be. I mean, we, we spent a few years putting the M back in MCH um, and, and we're really quite there now, importantly so, but okay. the, the maternal infant diet, I think is the, is the key to, for me to that answer. answer. Let's have Jeannie Conrad have the last question and then we have to move on. Well, thank you so much. And I want to thank this uh, esteemed panel for um, just the incredible breadth and depth of the discussions. Um, I think you really helped all of us um, with a vision. I've got one statement and one question because I the, the last comments about facing this as looking at this as a, a national emergency with the Surgeon General and the Secretary to me hits home. Um, I would like to point out that September 17th is World Patient Safety Day. And we, it, the theme of World Patient Safety Day this year is safe maternal and newborn care. The slogan is act now for safe and respectful childbirth. So if ever we were gonna look at this as an emergency and say, what can the United States do? I would suggest that, that sorry, that just came to mind as you were discussing and I saw this. And my question is really about looking at how compelling the Affordable Care Act is and how much it can do, but the restrictions we have and the limitations that have come about um, without full adoption and not being able um, to do what we would like in all states. Where do we go? How do we bring about changes? Um, what's the direction for us uh, with improving access to care, improving just the ability to be able to be seen and cared for with universal health coverage and universal uh, rights? Anybody? <laughs> Well, great question, Jeannie. I mean, uh, I, hi, Scott. But if we, I wish we, if we had the answer, I think you know, you know, we'd be doing it. And I think you know, Michael Warren uh, mentioned in the chat, you know, looking upstream and you know, access to care is absolutely vital, and all the bits and pieces that Secretary mentioned earlier, and you know, expanding uh, coverage for pregnant women. That's all important. You know, access to care is part of the equation. It's important part. Um, but looking at those upstream issues and, and you all have discussed them, including racism is really critical. Yeah. So I'll just put that out there. I, I wish I had the Thank you. magical answer for you here today, but yeah. thanks. Thank you. Thank you for everybody's comments. Danielle, do you have any closing thoughts before we move on? Yes, thank you. Um, it has been such a pleasure to have been able to moderate this session and to be able to learn from experts in the field and knowing that I'm in and that we're all in and how can we change the language and move our nation to be all in like that is that is the greatest um, that is the greatest I think journey that I'm looking forward to for the rest of my life so um, and to, to Jeannie's comment about um, having universal health care and access and Scott Burns, you're, um, you know, understanding, yes, that acknowledgement that access to care is important, but understanding also that it's that access to care is important, but that it doesn't mean equity. We're not going to achieve better outcomes just because we have access, right? And that, um, and I firmly believe that it goes back to reconciling this truth and reconciliation as a nation. And so it's moving beyond the borders of MCH. It's moving beyond the borders of just maternal infant. And can you believe we had to fight for maternal? I cannot believe we had to fight for the word maternal to be a part of this discussion. And it's still sometimes a battle today, but recognizing that it is a, it's a population. It is a human thing. It is a community thing. And we have to see each other as human beings for us to move forward. So we can do what we can with our children and their children's children. And so it's the steps that we're trying to take now that we're trying to identify which best to which steps to take best now to move forward. Thank you so much for this. Thank you, Janelle, for leading yeah. this session so well. Uh, really did a, yeah. a great session. Beautiful. 
it left me with uh, some some real sense that now is the time to act. We have absolutely public or leading medical care, physician oriented medical care on board, ready to take this on. We've got the maternal and child health leadership organizations on board, ready to take off. We have all the HHS secretaries on board saying this is a crisis, not only racism as a crisis, but maternal health in particular racism. And so we have a time and we heard it from Secretary Sebelius, be bold, now is the time. And I think, and as I heard Jeannie say, you know, September 17th or whatever, yeah. we draft a, draft a recommendation that we can put in there that we can get to the secretary to sign on to that day. I think we should move forward. Now is the time for us to act. Now is the time not to be bold. And AMA has incredible marketing tools to help us leverage that message. Just looking at your document, Alitha, that is a, a well-crafted thing. And, and we Beautiful. Need use those those kinds of techniques to change that narrative to get it out there we should have maternal mortality as these and infant mortality as the centerpiece of all public policy and as related to that uh the second part of magda's question i'm advocating with mchb that we actually change our name add another m to sacum secretary's advisory committee on infant and maternal mortality um, which really reflects what we do so that we have that. So thank you to the panelists. Thank you for all of the work that you've done. Uh, and, and thank you for your suggestions to us on what we can do. I got some good ideas. I think you were really clear in saying this is what we can do. And we are pledged to, to push you as best we can to do what you already want to do. And so our job is to, you know, we, it's the inside outside game in, in a couple of different ways. So, so thank you very much for, for being with us today. Uh, let us now move on to the, the, the data piece. And I've asked Magda to, to kind of take this on uh, since she's the chair of our, our working group on, on data and research to action. Um, and I know that uh, uh, Dr. Barfield has some, some particular data elements uh, that she wants to discuss. And I know the, uh, 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 we had some, some work related to the, I can't remember, the Governor Accountability Office uh, related to data. And so we're gonna work on this over the next half hour or so. So Magda, take it away. Well, um, may I just encourage 30 seconds for people just to take a breath. This is, this is a moment for self-care and without any bio break built in, um, and sitting being a, um, an extraordinary um, contributor in excess, whatever you need to do for 30 seconds, just to stretch and create the space to shift from the macro, if you will, of uh, addressing racism as threat, crisis, emergency with urgency in this time with the diet of women and children together, mothers and their babies and fathers and families. So this is my way to create a little bit of space just to stretch and breathe. And for, for all of us, two more intros real quick, um, for all of us who are um, managing, uh, as Tara said yesterday, and Colleen, our lives and our work. And as somebody who's an immediate now cancer free, a thriver as a woman as of Thursday. I just encourage us to do as much self-care as we can. As we talk about them, we talk about us and take care of our own well-being and ushering this work forward. And last, as a proud uh, member of the City Match Board, ex officio, uh, as the founder of City Match, and as you heard their own one practice that they put forth as an example of being all in, I just wanna say what an honor it is with humility and respect to have woken this morning in Richmond, California, which is the sacred native land of the Oholoni, Mukwekma, and Xochenga uh, tribes who come as ancestors before us. And I would encourage us to, as members of this organization to adopt ways of of honoring tribal ancestry and sovereignty and respect for the land upon which we stand. And towards that end, 
one of the ways, one of the languages of power is the language of data. Data, which we in our recommendations that we will come to hopeful some consensus on before we close today. Data, both qualitative and quantitative, numerator and denominator, and data which welcome community and human voices to inform our decision-making, lead to action and accountability. And as Art James put in the chat just now, constantly measuring the difference and disparity in the gap will lead to our sustaining a sense of call to conscience in our work in anti-racism and in undoing racism and promoting equity. Towards that end, this session focused on data and surveillance around issues and updates allow us to go from that macro to the specific around data systems as we hear from four colleagues uh, who are in government and need our assistance at SACOM to be able to, to help them uh, do their best work. And they are here to advise us on how to do our best work. They will introduce themselves beyond um, what is in the agenda. I don't need to read that, but I wanna thank my colleagues, Wanda Barfield, Lee Warner, Ada, and Ada just helped me, uh, Deake, um, and Lee Wilson uh, for helping us um, get to the heart of the precision and purpose of data, which is to lead to action. Dr. Barfield, would you start us off and then we'll go straight through if you would then introduce Dr. Warner and then uh, Dr. Deke and then um, uh, Dr. Wilson. Uh, I'm upgrading you all to Dr. Honorific if it was not there otherwise uh, to make it an equal playing field. And then at the end, we will have a bit of time for some comment and question. Uh, so uh, Wanda, give us a start. So uh, first of all, I just wanna thank the committee for providing the time for us to talk with you today. As you all know, there are many surveillance systems within the Division of Reproductive Health, maternal mortality, including assistive reproductive technology and other surveillance systems. But the one unique system that we have that really is an opportunity to listen to women and to really understand the challenges as well as the opportunities for them at, through pregnancy in the postpartum period is the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, or PRAMS. And given all of the recent issues that are going on, including this rich discussion, we have a real opportunity to do good surveillance in terms of understanding the perceptions, the beliefs, the, the risk factors that affect pregnant and postpartum women in the United States. So in, in this vein, we have an opportunity that we wanna to present to the committee and that's the phase nine revision. And I will have Dr. Lee Warner and Ada Dayeki talk more about that. Lee Warner is the chief of the women's health and fertility branch in our division. He has extensive experience with surveillance, including PRAMS and Ada Dayeki, who is a project officer on the PRAMS team, a former EIS officer who's also done extensive work in terms of understanding racial and ethnic disparities, particularly in infertility and assisted reproductive technology. So I, without further ado, I would like to introduce them and have them really share with you. We want to hear from you because we see this as a unique opportunity to inform this survey. Thank you. Thanks, Wanda. Uh, thank you, Wanda. Can you hear, everybody hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So uh, like Wanda said, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to present in front of ACM. Um, I, I very much appreciate the last discussion and the importance of data and collecting data in surveillance related to racism and discrimination. Um, these are one of the things that you'll hear about from Ada when I turn it over in about uh, a few minutes. Uh, one of the things that we are exploring for consideration to include in our phase nine survey. So what I'm gonna do is give a quick overview of PRAMS, a couple of public service announcements about uh, recent updates, and then I will turn it over to Ada to uh, bring it home. Next slide, please. 
Um, for those of you that may not be as familiar, PRAMS has been uh, around for nearly 35 years as an ongoing population-based uh, surveillance system um, that is recorded every year. We collect self-reported maternal behaviors and experiences around the time of pregnancy. Our sampling is drawn from the birth certificate, therefore we are linked with birth certificate data to further enrich our, our uh, data. And we provide jurisdiction-specific and near national estimates. Uh, the PRAMS website's also on the slide. I encourage you to take a look. Thank you, Wanda, for posting the chat. And next slide. So uh, two updates. The first one, we just announced our new funding cycle, five-year funding cycle um, back in May. And we, have, we are currently funding 50 jurisdictions from 2021 through 2025, including 46 states and four cities and territories including our newest addition, the North America Islands. We represent 81% of live births. Even for states that are uh, not currently in the PRAMS, we uh, liaise with them to increase the representation of PRAMS. Next slide, please. Hello? Uh, thank you, thank you, it was a delay on my end. Uh, I'm also pleased to announce that PRAMS has been working very hard to make more recent data available, especially in recent years. Uh, in, in April, we released our 2019 data that is from 2019 births. It also includes new indicators on prescription opioid use during pregnancy and maternal disabilities. Um, those two are, were in select jurisdictions. Again, that data is available. You can hit on the link below. If you have any questions about how to access the data, um, feel free to reach, reach out directly to me and we will get you that data. Um, and then for 2020 data, we're expecting to release that later this year in the fall and we will have an additional new indicator uh, that is uh, looking at the COVID-19 experience uh, that is uh, behaviors around uh, people who did during uh, around uh, COVID. And we've implemented that in, uh, I believe it's 34 sites. The next slide, please. Our current phase eight questionnaire, you can see we have established topics that have, we've been uh, collecting data on for a long time, ranging from preconception care to intimate partner violence to breastfeeding if in sleep environment. And so our questionnaire has not been uh, we have had a new questionnaire in the field since 2016, which is why this moment is so important, why we appreciate the uh, committee allowing us time to present because we are now looking for feedback. So what we've been doing is uh, to collect data on emerging MCH topics, and you see them on the slide chronologically. Um, we've been adding questionnaire supplements uh, to, to our survey, ranging from e-cigarette use to, as I mentioned, prescription opioid use and maternal disability, and most recently on uh, COVID-19 experience in 2020. With our 2021 survey, we will be adding a, a supplement on COVID-19 vaccine, as well as social terms of health. So the, the time is, timing is very good. Uh, next slide, please. And now I'd like to turn it over to Adad Vieke, who will summarize what we've done so far in our phase on questionnaire revision and why are we are here today to uh, seek input from the committee. Uh, again, thank you for your time, and I'm going to turn it over to Adad. Thank you, Lee, and thank you, Wanda, for the introduction and the opportunity to share the activities of the phase nine questionnaire revision process. And good afternoon, committee members. Next good afternoon. Time. Thank you. Okay, so for the revision of the PRAMS Phase 9 survey, we have three main goals. Number one is to update the survey content. We want to ensure that the topics are still relevant for use in the current environment and that the survey addresses emerging priorities in MCH. The second goal is to make sure that we engage with an array of internal and external partners to capture priority topics. 
And the third goal is to align with national performance measures such as Healthy People 2030 and Title V performance measures that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Next slide. So I wanna review with you the timeline of activities for phase nine. Earlier this year, we did internal planning and consultations within CDC and with other federal partners, including HRSA, on how they have managed the questionnaire revision process within their surveys and surveillance systems. We completed the solicitation of phase nine topics where we sought input from 300 plus partners on priority and emerging areas relevant to MCH. I will discuss this in a bit on the next slide. Next slide. Here are examples of feedback that we've received regarding the core survey. So both enhancements of existing topics from the current survey, as well as new topics to consider that were identified by colleagues in our division, PRAMS grantees, and our partners. Areas recommended to be added to topics already found on the core survey range from an expanded focus on mental health especially anxiety, to aspects of pregnancy care, such as counseling for and awareness of urgent maternal warning signs, cardiac indicators, and management of chronic conditions, and maternal vaccinations, especially Tdap and COVID-19. New areas proposed for the core survey include adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, social determinants of health, emergency preparedness, patient-centered and respectful care, and maternal stressors. Next slide. And here are a few upcoming milestones. So from now until August, we will evaluate the question proposals related to these topics that come in from our partner solicitation sent in June. And just a reminder that the proposals are due July 9th. And then we will start to develop questions for the survey. Some partners have also approached us about supporting topics and questions, and we do welcome funding support. However, the ability to fund questions will not be considered in the selection or evaluation of the proposals. We will also continue to engage with our partners throughout the revision process. Our goal is to have the questionnaire content finalized by December, 2021, and to launch phase nine in the field in April, 2023. Next slide. Okay, so with that, I'd like to open it up to the committee for discussion. And here are a few questions for you all to think about. What topics would the committee like to see revised from the current phase eight questionnaire? What are the committee's thoughts on the proposed additions to phase nine questionnaire? And what other MCH topics should the phase nine questionnaire capture? Thank you, Ada. Sure. I open it for our members to uh, give immediate comment. And we also have a follow-up opportunity given the limited amount of timing we have today uh, for the data and research to action work group to be a place to assure that uh, you get input prior to July 9th um, so that uh, it's not only today's interaction. So colleagues. Hi, Steve Calvin here. Thank you for, for this work. Um, it's really great to know that, you know, four out of five pregnancies are covered by PRAMS. And um, what are the barriers that are, um, that are present in some states to, to get them involved? I'll take that uh, one. So I think for uh, some of the states, they're able to support uh, internally with their own funding and structure. What, what it does, um, they miss out on the, the PRAMS infrastructure and we've worked really hard the past decade or so to increase the number of states um, and territories that we have. So like the slide said, we're currently at 81%, but I mentioned um, we, with California and Ohio, we align on questionnaire items. Uh, we do our best to align on um, methodology too. And so if you include, especially California and, and their system, 
uh, we're at, we're around 96 or 98 percent. Wow. And then just a quick follow up question. Is there coordination between the office, the national coordinator um, in what you're doing? And are there any thoughts of, you know, a lot of a lot of um, patients are are cared for and, you know, have access to patient portals, you know, for the electronic health record? Um, are, are there kind of longer term plans on ways of just kind of making it really easy to do multiple surveys throughout you know, a, 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 the life course using those? I mean, I'm kind of going off in a bunch of different directions, but. Um, this, no, this... I, I, I love the thought. I mean, we're, we're here to talk about phase nine, but um, I, I enjoy the, 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 the dialogue and we need to be thinking forward um, all the time. So we actually had thought about the, the PRAMS responsors actually are very good in the current environment. We are hovering around 60% overall which is fantastic. And that's a lot due to our, uh, the TA provided by our project officers. Um, but we've even thought about doing some follow-up surveys. Once you have the folks to participate once, would they be willing to do follow-up surveys later on um, as their infant progresses in age? And so that's one thing we thought about with, uh, we, we recently completed our first uh, callback survey with PRAMS uh, as part of our uh, opioid uh, response work. And so, and that was very successful. So it is something that's on our radar. We're trying to get the data out faster first, but we, we certainly want to pay attention to that. Thank yeah, I, I think just another thing to add, Steve, in terms of issues of data linkages, we're currently exploring with, a, with Corey funding the linkage of PRAMS data to hospital discharge, because we do know that women, although they, you know, are great at re reporting certain experiences, um, medical information and history may not be as well uh, reported. We also are thinking about doing some linkages with um, the NPIC survey that also looks at facilities in terms of uh, breastfeeding rates yeah. and success. So that's, that's an opportunity as well. And at the state level, depending on state capacity and, as you may know, some of the relative challenges of what I call the permission slip, um, there are data linkages between BRAMS, hospital discharge, healthy start, um, ART surveillance data in some states so that they're really trying to cover a broader brush. On the national mm -hmm. level, I think we are learning some things as we think about our data modernization efforts, and where are the opportunities to get national data? Thank you for that, Dr. Barfield. Dr. Ellinger. Yes, um, I, I support. I really like the fact you're putting ACEs. When we added ACEs to the BRFSS in Minnesota, we really got a lot of really important information that helped. The other is, I know the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine looked at the Healthy People 2030. Um, objectives and added some things and some of there are some things that were rejected uh, and they just had an article in JAMA that came out uh, just a, a, a day or two ago and they added ACEs as one of those things that should have been there but they also talked about mental disability but environmental uh, factors uh, housing uh, uh, disruption and segregation um, and heat vulnerability and voting I think these are things that we, that Actually, like voting, for example, is a power uh, uh, message for pregnant women. And I would love to see how many people are voting. And I think that should be something that could be part of PRAMS, along with a lot of the environmental issues, the housing segregation, uh, and those kinds of things. Right. Can we go back to the slide with all the, yeah. the suggested topics, please? Thank you. I was going to suggest that, Lee. So people don't. Yeah, uh, uh, and, 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 and I, I just want to comment. Oh, there you go. I also wanted. Yeah, okay. I also wanted to just uh, comment. Uh, we we are trying to align with HP uh, twenty thirty, and so Holly Shulman from our PREMS program has been a representative for our division on this. Um, I also want to draw your attention to the note Michael uh, put in the chat. We we have had a large program. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we we've tried to. Uh, gather data in PRAMS for uh, Healthy Start participants to look at the effectiveness of that program. And that project is now complete and we are in the analytic mm -hmm. phase. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to go to, are you, are you done, Ed, with your hand up? Because I'll go to Belinda, and then I will add a comment after that. And we're going a little past time, but we're going to, we're going to give this its due diligence. Uh, Belinda. Thank you. Um, Lee, I was looking at the new topics where you talk about experiences of discrimination and racism. I thought there was already an, maybe an optional question in PRAMS that talks about something like how often do you think about your race or for some reason, I thought it was another question that was already there, not to say that we couldn't expand upon that and, and um, you know, add to it, but I was thinking there was already one question. Am I there, there is one, yeah, there, there is one question. That's a great uh, uh, point, Belinda. I wanna point out these are additions to the core. Got it. And uh, the, we're, we're looking at, again, there is, uh, the core is precious real estate. So we want to make sure we get the exact right topics the most important MCH topics, and that they're worded properly, um, that we can leverage the first certificate for all it's worth. Uh, but I, I, the, the, the other issue with it being on the, the, some of the state uh, uh, state questionnaires is that, that sometimes the wording is slightly different and it makes measuring comparability between states a little difficult. So mm -hmm. uh, again, um, I also wanna emphasize and go back to Steve's question, these are not, these are the proposed additions. The decisions have not been made at this point. And that's why it's right. really, really important that we hear from this committee, not only now, but uh, to July 9th, and we'd be glad to have a right. separate call or dialogue with the committee about this. Right. Adal, is there anything you want to add to um, Belinda's question about racism? Um, no, you, um, Lee, I think you covered it perfectly. Uh, the PRAMS questionnaire currently has different iterations of discrimination, whether it's based on race or based on gender or language. Mm -hmm. There's different iterations, but like Lee said, um, this is looking to propose it for addition to the core so that it's right. standardized. So you need to hear from us if this is something we definitely wanna make sure is on the core. We right. need to hear from you. I can't <laughs> yes. emphasize it enough. This is a probably a once right. in a decade opportunity. And we, I mean, we are relishing this time with the committee. It's very right. important for the uh, future right. progress of France. Um Well, in the interest of time, uh, I would like to thank um, uh, our colleagues and to recognize we have one more speaker today, Lee Wilson, uh, to come on board. We can guarantee that we will look at our data and research for action recommendations and uh, see the opportunity to call out a specific recommendation um, at this time um, that would be relevant to strengthening um, the existing surveillance system of PRAMS and its interoperability and articulation with other data systems. Um, the notion of, of adding uh, social determinants and including the experience of homelessness and eviction, uh, particularly given CDC's own ban on eviction in the context of COVID, um, would be um, um, essential for the core, but at least salient and timely as a topical issue. Um, and we get to model in PRAMS again, what are the um, standardized metrics to operationalize how okay. we're going to measure the impact of racism on maternal and infant health outcomes. So uh, we will convene the draw group with an invitation to our other uh, colleagues within the next week to be able to operationalize this and come back to you uh, in this window of opportunity. Thank you, Ada. Thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you, uh, Wanda, for bringing this forward. Um, in the remaining time that we do not have, but we will borrow back, I want to uh, invite Lee Wilson, who is Division Director in Healthy Start and Perinatal Services, to give us um, an additional uh, update uh, of, um, of data implications. So um, uh, there you are, Lee. Good to see you again, back in a new capacity. So if you would Thanks. take off the old hat and put on your current hat uh, for this particular one, we welcome you back into this, bringing your many talents to bear. Thanks, Magda. Um, and thank you to the CDC folks, Wanda, Ada, um, and Lee for uh, making the presentation on PRAMS. We're glad to um, be able to make the space. And I'd like to offer to any of the committee members, um, if you would like to have us convene another opportunity for another discussion, please um, let Vanessa Lee know and we will make a space and arrange, do all of the logistics work for making sure that something 
um, is that there's a space created for that exchange because um, it is very important and we value the good work that comes out of things. So thank you. Um, I'm going to be very brief, um, mostly because there is not a lot of um, additional inf information to provide to you from the GAO report, but I will um, give you an update and I will give you the links to the GAO report on maternal mortality and morbidity, um, the process and findings that took place from January 2020 until this April when the report was released. Um, just a quick uh, summary report, as you know, the Government Accountability Office conducts audits, reviews, and studies of federal programs and activities um, at the request of Congress to assist in the development, administration, and oversight of their duties and authorities as the legislative branch. Um, and as you know, maternal health, both um, maternal morbidity and mortality, um, has received a tremendous amount of attention over the last five plus years. Um, both attention programmatically and legislatively, but also through funding, which um, has been reflected both in the work that we do and the uh, broadening scope or broader scope of this committee. Um, Congress is very aware that along with the numbers being um, troubling on the maternal morbidity and mortality side nationally, there's even greater risk um, for maternal death during pregnancy um, or shortly after, um, both in rural areas and in other underserved areas. And this affects areas um, that are, it, it makes it harder to provide services to address these issues and that there are lots of um, shortages of healthcare services to these populations. So Congress has, which is no surprise, directed GAO to gather and analyze information on morbidity and mortality and programs and data associated with that. In this case, um, information data collection programs addressing rural and underserved areas were the request given to GAO. This is the second GAO study that has been undertaken in recent years. Um, and the programs and the other efforts to address morbidity and mortality have been covered in both of these programs. So this particular study was interested in the data it was interested in rural and underserved, and it was interested in whether or not our programs were targeting those populations and whether we were collecting and able to report on the populations and in subpopulations within those groups. So rural and African-American, rural and Native American, rural and economic insufficiency. So um, we were uh, invited to participate in this engagement, which I would say many GAO studies are uh, relatively tense for the agency because they are looking to make sure we have systems and protocols in place to ensure that we are discharging our responsibilities effectively. This was a relatively uh, light touch engagement. They were very much partnering with us, exploring what we were doing and what we might do better. So it was a very pleasant set of engagements. As I said, it began in January, 2020. We had a series of meetings. They generally approach it through an entrance. Conference. Then there's data collection, statements of facts, draft reporting. Um, we have an opportunity to comment on that report. And then there's a final report and a statement of action. So what I would say is that GAO met with ARC, CDC, CMS, NIH, HRSA and a number of the uh, agencies or staff divisions within the department who uh, provide support to the department on maternal health, including the Office of Women's Health and the Office for Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. GAO called out CDC for special focus as the federal agency responsible for surveillance, the continuous systematic collection of health-related data um, on, on pregnancy-related deaths. GAO called out ARC as the primary agency responsible for collecting hospital administrative data and its, and its use um, for identifying and analyzing rates of mor uh, morbidity and mortality. And GAO called out HRSA as the primary federal agency charged with improving healthcare for people um, who are geographically, economically, and medically vulnerable. So those were the three agencies that they focused a good bit of attention in the review, although they did also look at um, at ARC when it came to data collection as well. Um, let me see, where are we? Um, they analyzed the uh, data that they found and they made three general recommendations. The first two recommendations 
were, well, so their finding was that the agencies were not collecting in a systematic way um, data on maternal morbidity and mortality that could be used um, as effectively as they might like to see. And their, two re their three recommendations were that the director of CDC and the administrator of HRSA should take steps to systematically disaggregate and analyze maternal health program data by rural and underserved areas and make adjustments to program efforts as needed. Um, in the response, uh, both agencies accepted this direction and we will be working on action steps to fulfill uh, those requests from <coughs> GAO. The um, third request was that there are two, eight, two working groups that were identified, the um, maternal and infant health uh, working group, infant and child health working group through the Healthy People Project. Um, and then there is an interagency working group that is led by the Office of Women's Health, both uh, doing data collection program development activities at the department level. And the, so that third recommendation was that these two HHS work groups develop and implement a coordinated approach to track and monitor maternal health efforts across HHS. So in other words, saying please uh, work more closely with each other and work more closely with the agencies. That recommendation was also accepted and we are in the process this summer and fall of working on action steps to ensure that we are complying with, uh, or not complying, that's a too strong word, that we are meeting the expectations of GAO in um, their report. I will follow up shortly with the link to the report for you in the chat box. And if there are any questions, sorry, I've rushed through this very quickly, but our, I know our time is short. Mm -hmm. If there are any questions, let me know. Um, Lee, I just want to start with um, a thank you for, um, for putting that forward. It was not front and center for some of our work before crafting some of the recommendations for today. And we will look through that lens to further uh, support uh, the follow through on the GAO recommendations because interoperability um, and, and other uh, aspects of what you've put forth is certainly what we are already recommending. So it looks like there is alignment, but let's talk about strategy about that alignment. Um, and we will make sure that this is uh, shared more broadly so that we have that lens. Um, immediate burning question for Lee, or and we can also bring it up in the draw follow-up group, which will convene within the next um, uh, week or so, so that we're being timely in response. Then towards this end, I wanna thank you all for um, the four of you for, for being part of helping us help you so that we can be more strategic and impactful for the women, children, families, and fathers that are counting on our leadership and follow through um, to make a difference together that is measurable and accountable and sustainable. Ed, I give it back to you. Thank you, Magda. And thank you for all of those presenters. The data piece is really important, obviously. And it's nice to see that that we're in alignment. Our recommendations are really in alignment with what's going on. Very in much so. Those various other uh, aspects. Uh, so we have one further update before we uh, get to public comment. And that's uh, with uh, by uh, comments by Karen Remley, director of the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities, uh, who's been in that office now for about a little over a year. So Karen, oh. it's nice to see you in that position. And so give us a little update. Great, thank you. Um, and I have to say it's not a year yet, we're at 10 months. And three of those months were spent um, in the response, but the good news is um, infants and moms and babies have been dear to my heart and part of everything I've done my whole career. I apologize for not being here earlier today, but I was um, giving a talk about adolescents and COVID vaccination to local and state health officials. So um, I appreciate uh, being able to talk with you now. Um, you all know Dr. Cheryl Broussard. She's also on the call and um, she is really the expert about what the center does. We're gonna talk about that. I would tell you to remember the center started 20 years ago with a vision to be able to really have an impact on birth defects and developmental disabilities but funding is very interesting and different for our center and that um, for, for 2021, we have 21 different funding lines and we are the smallest center um, at the CDC. Our vision is that babies are born healthy, children reach their full potential and everyone thrives. And we do that through studying and addressing the causes of birth defects, helping children reach their potential by understanding developmental disabilities and protecting people by reducing complications of blood disorders and improving the health of people with disabilities. 
So we cut across the lifespan, but also significantly, as you can imagine, all of those areas, stigma and an unwillingness for the general public to think about a lot of these um, birth defects, disabilities, and diseases um, are really a major issue for the groups we serve. Next slide. I want to very briefly today talk to you about what we are doing to address infant mortality. We will talk about preventing birth defects, reducing use of alcohol and other substances, monitoring emerging threats, and monitoring and understanding risk factors for fetal death. Next slide, please. Birth defects are a leading cause of infant mortality, causing, and I think we talked about this yesterday, one in every five deaths or 20% of birth defect of, of, of infant deaths in the first year of life, which equates to over 23,000 babies dying before their first birthday. Next slide, please. This is an important slide. A CDC morbidity and mortality weekly report from 2020 reported that approximately 11 infant deaths related to birth defects occurred for every 10,000 babies born in the United States. However, these rates differ by race, ethnicity, and gestational age. And I'm sure you, like me, looked at this slide for the first time and said, so why, do we know, why does this happen and what do we know? And the answer back is we don't have the research to understand that yet. We think it might be influenced by access to and utilization of healthcare before and during pregnancy, the lack of pre the variability in prenatal screening, losses of pregnancies with fetal anomalies, assurance type, but also what's not on this slide is care for the infant and access to care for the infant um, and the quality of that care after birth. Next slide. We have state-based birth defects tracking. We um, fund 10 out of the 43 states that have state-based birth, uh, birth defect tracking programs. Information is used to understand if birth defects are increasing or decreasing over time, planning and evaluating prevention activities, referring babies and families to services and helping states allocate their resources. Our data, we're not getting data from those 10 population-based programs yet, and that the funding was not adequate to bring the data to the CDC for full analysis, but work closely with those states to help them understand their data and work with them. Next slide, please. So identifying causes of birth defects. We, um, the Centers for Birth Defects Research and Prevention um, is CBDRP, are research centers across the nation that have been funded by the CDC to understand the causes of birth defects. These centers have been conducting one of the largest studies of birth defects ever undertaken in the United States, the National Birth Defects Prevention Study, or NBD. The centers built upon the success to further examine promising findings within the birth defect study to evaluate pregnancy exposures, affectionately called BD steps, and findings of these, this research helps inform clinical practice. The Committee on Obstetric Practices of ACOG wrote an opinion piece on drugs used for urinary tract infections and birth defects based on using this data. We confirm previously observed associations, generate new hypotheses for further study, identify areas for prevention, and provide um, information to the public. We also inform clinical practice in that doctors in Great Britain must inform patients about possible risk of birth defects after use of in vitro fertilization based on this data. Next slides, please. If we're gonna look more closely at a couple of specific types of birth defects, I will share with you the progress towards survival with spina bifida and with heart defects. Between 1979 and 2003, the survival of infants born with spina bifida improved. However, improvements um, really vary based on race, ethnicity, and Black and Hispanic infants continue to have poor survival compared with white infants. And, and again, think about prenatal care, um, care at the time of delivery, rapid um, access to specialized care for the baby, um, and uh, that continuing care. Um, we also promote the use of folic acid among all people who can get pregnant to prevent spina bifida and other neural tube defects, and we conduct public health research to decrease mortality, improve the health of those with spina bifida. Our work here, we were funded for a registry, which is run by the Spina Bifida Association, which is, of course, you have to access care in order to be in the registry. We do not have a population-based way of looking at overall care of spina bifida right now. We have worked very much in the last few years to try and make sure that while um, cereals and, and um, 
wheat flour and fortified with folic acid to include corn mesa flour, which is voluntarily now fortified in our country. Next slide, please. Turning to congenital heart defects, these are the most common types of birth defects and they affect nearly one in 110 births in the United States. When your survival for infants with critical congenital heart defects improved between 1979 and 1993 and 1994 to 2005, yet mortality remained very high. Newborn screening using pulse oximetry can identify the defects before infants leave the hospital, reducing infant mortality. In a JAMA article published last year, CDC and collaborators were able to show that mandated population-wide critical congenital heart disease screening using pulse oximetry reduces early infant deaths from critical CHD by 33%, or 120 early infant deaths from critical congenital heart disease averted every year. We're working with partners to track state implementation of screening and how it is being implemented nationwide, and we're doing public health research to improve health and reduce mortality of those living with birth defects. Importantly, another area that needs to be investigated is different, are there differences and disparities between babies of color um, and mothers of color and how much of that is secondary to access to care. Next slide, please. Another key division priority is to reduce in utero alcohol exposure through implementation of alcohol screening and brief intervention approaches and awareness and education efforts for women of reproductive age and their healthcare providers. Alcohol SBI or that, that brief intervention has been shown to reduce risky alcohol use in a variety of settings and among multiple population groups. It is recommended by the US Preventive T Services Task Force for people 18 and older, including pregnant women and widely supported by federal agencies, medical groups and professional organizations. We're also taking lessons learned from our many years of studying fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders to see how they can be applied to other substances of concern, including opioids and marijuana use. And I won't, in the interest of time, won't read the whole slide, but I know you all have access to them. Next slide, please. Through competitive funding from the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluations, the Cori Trust Fund, we established MATLINK which is a network to monitor maternal, infant, and child health outcomes associated with treatment for opioid use disorder during pregnancy. We have been able to expand the number of funded clinical sites from seven to seven and extending the time children are followed up to six years, because you can imagine how important it is to look at long-term outcomes. These additional sites will increase the study population of pregnant people and improve racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic characteristics and expand the geographic reach. Results will inform clinical practice recommendations and clinical decision-making around treatment for opioid use disorder among pregnant people. And I must tell you, um, I can't announce the last three because it's not public yet, but we paid close attention to geographic um, representation, tribal representation, and groups that were less represented in the first sites. Next slide, please. And then surveillance, surveillance for emerging threats to mothers and babies. And as many of you know, this built on the work um, that we did during the Zika response. We established SETNET, which is a mother baby linked longitudinal surveillance system, which can detect the effects of new health threats like COVID-19 on pregnant women and their babies by collecting data from pregnancy through childhood. We use evidence-based actionable information to help save and improve the lives of mothers and babies with Zika, hepatitis C, syphilis, and now COVID-19. We were able to pivot that surveillance for COVID-19 and collecting longitudinally linked surveillance data on pregnant women and their infants through six months of age. And as of May, 2021, 25 jurisdictions have submitted birth and infant outcome data through SETNET and CDC has received data from nearly 19,000 pregnant women and their infants. Um, and we show that the data did show that women with COVID-19 may be at increased risk of having a preterm infant, which may lead to serious health problems for the infant. And we partner very closely with Dr. Bale Barfield and her division on this work. Next slide, please. This gives you an idea of where the jurisdictions are that are currently funded for SETNET through either the ELC cooperative agreement or a separate contractual mechanism. Um, and where a staff is also there to help, the stars are where staff are there to help. Um, you can imagine in a, a world where funding was not an issue that if we had set net across the country um, and in territories and tribes, and we'll be able to look at not just emerging infectious disease threats, 
but other causes of birth defects, we'd have um, an abundance of information to be able to make important decisions on. Next slide. And finally, I wanna briefly mention the work we're doing to monitor and understand risk factors of fetal death. Each year, about 2,400 babies are still born in the United States. Because the annual number of fetal deaths in the United States is roughly equivalent to the number of infant deaths each year, we are working to monitor, better understand the causes and understand how we can prevent fetal deaths. So we have funded two of the Centers for Birth Effects Research and Prevention, Arkansas, Massachusetts, to better understand factors that might increase the risk of stillbirth. These states birth effects tracking systems have been expanded to identify all pregnancies that result in stillbirth, not just those with a birth defect. Next slide, please. The knowledge about the potential causes of stillbirth can be used to create recommendations, policies, and services, um, and hopefully potentially reduce the risk of stillborn and stillbirth in women and families. And as you can see, Black mothers are more than twice as likely to experience a stillbirth compared to Hispanic and white mothers. And that is one of the reasons why we wanted to invest in understanding this problem more. Next slide. With the coming of Dr. Walensky and with me being new to the center, we're very aggressively looking at what information we don't have to be able to fulfill the CDC's core commitment to health equity. Um, some data we are unable to click, some data we don't have the funding to expand to, to be able for many rare conditions, um, get the information we need, but we are definitely working in every way we can to cultivate comprehensive health equity science, to optimize our intervention, to re reinforce and expand robust partnerships and to enhance capacity and workforce engagement. Um, all of our work um, in the entire center is being looked at with a lens of these four components this summer to make sure that we are maximizing our work and that we are not ignoring disparities that exist and working to understand those and make a difference. Last slide. And you've also heard that the CDC is undergoing a process of data modernization. We are hoping through our center to be able to leverage existing systems that exist that bring in information to the infectious disease side of the house Think about reportable diseases um, and all the electronic health record data and claims data that have come and birth data and death data that come into the CDC. How we, can we connect those to better understand um, infants, birth defects, uh, newborn screening results? There is no national place where uh, newborn screening results are collected. We hope to be able to work together with our partners at HRSA and NIH and at the CDC to better understand not only metabolic um, disorders and metabolism in newborns, but also birth effects and causes of stillbirth and prematurity. Next slide. And in doing that, this is just one example where we use machine learning to show promise in, in predicting birth defect cases up until now. Um, medical uh, providers had to review each chart, um, which can be very cumbersome and, and, and requires a lot of work. But by using machine learning, we're able to develop algorithms that help us um, be able to maybe surveil for birth defects in a more cost-effective and actually in a much larger scope. And I will stop there and um, see Dr. Ellinger if anybody else has any questions that I know we're at time, so I'm happy to talk to anybody you know, at any other time too. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Remley, appreciate that. Good, inf good information. Uh, Sorry, it's taken so long to have you guys back to the committee. So it's good to get that update. Um, Kara, I figured you might have a question since that was birth defects was the issue that you brought up yesterday as your primary. Yes. I did. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. I really, um, really appreciate your talk. That was a lot of great information. Just a, a quick question when you brought up um, the data that you're collecting about spina bifida and congenital heart disease and, um, you know, you know, really monitoring like the fol folic acid and uh, newborn screening. Can you talk a little bit more about whether you've been um, monitoring fetal, um, any um, fetal treatment options that are available and that women are, you know, that they are accessing, you know, as far as like fetoscopic procedures for um, spina bifida or fetal surgery, just if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful question. And actually, I spent very early this morning listening to, and I think Allison had to leave early, the NIH has had a, a series of three, three different large um, four-hour events on gene therapy and on 
fetal surgery and all of the things that are out there. And I've actually talked with um, Dr. Bowerfield, Dr. Warren, and Dr. Bianchi at the NIH to um, have us have an opportunity to sit down and really understand where do we think the field is going? Are we at CDC and my center doing the appropriate surveillance? Um, you know, the, the center was a hope of being a national surveillance system for birth defects, but we never really were able to fill that promise because the funding didn't come. But how do we connect carrier screening, prenatal care, um, what is being done in um, prenatal surgery and fields that are constantly evolving? And I think the point you make, Tara, that I heard you yesterday that's passion to me is making sure it's available to everyone so that it's not, you know, um, if I'm a um, potential new mother and father that, you know, are brilliant and read everything and know everybody at Harvard, I have access to therapies. And if I'm a mom um, who doesn't have access to all of that information, I don't have access to those therapies. So better understanding what's there, what should be a public health commitment? You know, we know that newborn screening, critical congenital heart disease screening and early hearing um, de defects are all public health centered and that every child in every state and territory and tribe gets access to that. But what does that look like when we start to talk about all these other therapies? Mm -hmm. So I think it's an excellent question. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that really helps. And just one final a quick question. Just you mentioned the set that data. Does that data include COVID-19 vaccine data or just COVID-19 experiences? We have um, through pilot, and I'm looking at Wanda and, and Cheryl because they can help with me here too, but we have um, the Be Safe system, which you, any of you got vaccinated may have been asked to enroll in Be Safe, Be Safe mm -hmm. which is a text message based um, way to when you've gotten a vaccine to be able to give information back to CDC. Um, very large numbers of women identified themselves as being pregnant at the time of being vaccinated. You can imagine early on it was healthcare providers and many of those are women and many of those are of childbearing age. So we're closely following them post-vaccine too. And I don't know, Wanda, uh, I see you're, you're off mute, so you may want to add a little bit more to that. Yes, that's a great question. And, and Cheryl may be able to add, um, you know, this has been an airplane that's been constructed while flying and the wonderful opportunity of the, you know, pilot team, again, in collaboration with um, NCIRD and with Karen's center, as well as um, our center to really think about monitoring women's uh, reaction to vaccination has been quite robust. And they've been currently collecting data, I think now close to 5,000 women or over 5,000 women. Um, and then your question about the linkage to uh, SETNET, I think that opportunity may, may present itself, but right now it's really collecting the data in terms of the V-SAFE system and asking women questions with regard to uh, their, their reactions, if any, to the vaccination. Great. Thanks so much, Karen and Wanda. Sure. Very helpful. Uh, one last question. And this is, this is Cheryl. I just dropped in the chat the website to the VSAFE Pregnancy Registry. Check that out. Um, thank you so much for a terrific update, Karen, and delighted to see the collaboration happening. Uh, uh, two very quick comments. One is that I challenge us as we look towards the end of the day in our recommendations in the data and research action we have called out for an expansion of maternal mortality review and for fetal and infant mortality review as one specific surveillance system that is community engaged to move forward. There are gaps obviously in SetNet and others that would be better if brought to scale. And so I just will um, assure that we will um, uh, be broader in our lens as we consider the conversations today and presentations on PRAMS and from birth defects and developmental disabilities with SETNET about what is the opportunity gap by not expanding and harmonizing and integrating um, our maternal and infant mortality and morbidity related surveillance systems with greater infusion of resources. We can say that you can't. So um, we would like very much to uh, augment our, our lens a bit. And the second is for Ed, you talked about yesterday, uh, what are emerging issues, the data modernization that you have brought about, about using machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to predict birth defects will only be as strong as equity is built in. And the implicit bias in artificial intelligence systems means that the people who write the code 
are the ones that um, bake in racism and bias. And it is implicit, now explicit upon, and the onus is on us to inform through the lens of maternal and infant mortality prevention and the promotion of women and children's health that any use of artificial intelligence, the modernization of data that is going to try to um, further us in our work has got to be able to be looked at in its baking and making for potential implicit bias in the design itself. So at, at some future part of our agenda, as I've been talking about the last two years, it, it, we need to be ahead of this curve and looking at it through the lens of maternal and infant health could be a fabulous and powerful proxy for influencing design and policy. Thank you so much for your time and for your presentations. Thank you. And Magda, I would say you're right about both counts. Um, when I ask questions of the scientists and epidemiologists we have, when we're collecting information, not from across the country about rare, rare birth defects or diseases. And it, we never get enough numbers for tribes. We never get enough number, you know, if, and especially if we don't have a center in an area that has a large tribal population. Um, so constantly, as we look at potential ethnic and racial differences to really understand them, you have to have enough data to really make good decisions. And that's part of data modernization is really making sure that we have enough data to make those decisions and we don't just default to whatever the largest group in that state is. Um, you also know if you're looking at birth defects in Massachusetts, the environmental impacts and the toxic exposures and epigenetics and er infection, everything else is really different there than it might be in Arizona or Montana. So as we expand this reach and think about infant maternal mortality, I, I couldn't agree with you mo more. Having access to data early to prevent infant and maternal mortality um, and to have optimal life for that child um, is so critically important. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for your, your presentation. Great, great presentation, good information. Magda, thank you for bringing up that point. And I actually look to you and your group to actually potentially add some comments about that in our background paper, just in raising that equity issue, uh, I think would be good to to braise as something that needs to be concerned. I think most people will not, it'll, that'll be new information to them. So it'll be good to, good to have. Uh, so again, thank you, Dr. Remily and uh, Cheryl for all of this, this good information. Sure. Uh, let's now, before we get into our final work, uh, let's have the public comment. Lee, uh, do we have any public comment? Yes, hi folks. Um, we're now at the public comment period. One person has requested in advance to make public comment uh, by the name of Brenda Bandy. Um, Dr. Bandy, Ms. Bandy, um, we are uh, allowing three minutes for public comments. If you would press star one um, on your keypad to alert the operator to unmute you. We will give you three, mon three minutes to uh, discuss the comments you made around integration of breastfeeding into infant mortality, um, into the infant mortality conversation. Thank you. Vincent, are we hearing from Ms. Bandy? No, we do not see her in the audience. Um, if she wants to, if she has a raise hand feature, if she's under a different name, but um, I think we saw her this morning and we don't see her this afternoon. Alrighty, so I am going to, she, she had a sentence or two in her request to us for public comment. I will insert that into the chat box for you and we'll make sure that it's in your notes. Um, if there are no, uh, why don't we provide 30 seconds for anyone else if they have any other public comments. We generally do this if there's a little bit of available time. Um, I'll allow 30 seconds, Vincent, if anyone uh, raises their hand. Yeah. Okay, Pat Lothman is now unmuted. She had her hand raised. Am I on? Yes, ma'am, you are. Please, Hi. you have 30, three minutes to provide a comment. Hi, I, my name is Pat Loftman. I am a midwife from New York City. 
I've been a midwife for 40 years. 30 of those years were in clinical practice and I've been retired for the past 10 years. However, not, not quietly, I'm on the New York City Maternal and Mortality Review Committee. But when I was in clinical practice, part of my work was with, was with precepting midwifery students. And the mantra that I always um, gave them was that the two most important aspects of care was number one, establishing a relationship and number two, providing respectful care. Because I think if, if we talk about all of the systems and all of the wonderful services that we have uh, to provide women to have excellent outcomes, but you know, this is, it becomes a test of if we build it, will they come? So in as much as the discuss, there's been a lot of discussion about listening to women, I'm not certain if you're familiar with, there's a British midwife whose name is Sarah Swathi Vedam. She published a study a few years ago about the integration of midwives in, in terms of improved maternity outcomes. And she also published a study called uh, Giving Voices where women described their, uh, their maternity experience during birth. And their experience was described as coercive and disrespectful. Um, during their birth experience. So I think, and so one data point that uh, existed in her presentation was that she asked women in their subsequent birth, whether they would opt for an out of hospital birth. And what surprised me was that 25% of black women said that they would opt, they would consider an out of hospital birth. And the reason that stunned me is because traditionally black women want a hospital birth. And so the fact that they would even consider an out of hospital birth for their next pregnancy was surprising. And so I think we have to consider that while it's really important for us to develop systems, one of the things that they talked about was really wanting race concordant care. And that's something that I don't think really came through. Um, I didn't really hear it. And that's something that I would really want to emphasize because I, I don't know how much social media you see, but I see uh, on black social media, women who would absolutely, to avoid going into a hospital, have an unattended out of hospital birth. And that for me is very frightening. Thank you, Ms. Laughman. I appreciate your, uh, your comments. Um, if you should have a letter or any documentation that you would like to submit as part of your uh, statement, please feel free to do so and we will follow up and make sure that it's provided to the committee. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a nice day. Ed, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you all for uh, taking the time. All right. Thank you, Lee. Uh, we've got about uh, 45 minutes left. Uh, as we looked at the recommendations that we had, there was just one that we hadn't gone through, and that was, and I'm glad that Paul Wise is now back with us. It was uh, in, in the section related to immigrant and migrant, migrant and border health. It was a suggestion from Gene Conry to add on the fourth recommendation uh, HHS should support reinstatement of ICE's presumptive release policy that applied to pregnant detainees. Um, and and you know, that was, we hadn't had a discussion on that one. Is that something, Paul, that, that would make sense in that uh, recommendation? Yes, I think that, that that would be helpful. It's fairly technical, um, but it is a recognition of the, um, of importance of uh, addressing the special needs of pregnant women in immigration detention. So uh, I think that that would be uh, useful to keep in there. So thank you. All right. All right. We've gone through all of the, the new recommendations uh, very briefly. and We've gone through all of them yesterday. Um, are there any recommendations that, and, and the, the process will be there. There will be some wordsmithing that that needs to go on, and I'll be working. I hope to be working with uh, the chairs of the the various work groups to just to to clarify the the wording or get it down to as as precise as as we can without changing the meaning. So I would like us to be able to approve these recommendations, the general meanings of them, the approach that they're taking, with allowance us to sort of 
kind of crystallize the, the language and make it a little bit clearer if there's some redundancy in that. But are there any recommendations that people would like to pull out and have a discussion on at this point in time? And is it helpful to put them back up again? Uh, that's why first I wanted to see if there was, if, if you, you should have those with you, but uh, if it would be helpful, we can certainly do that. Uh, Vanessa, can you put up the, the recommendations? Sure, one second. Ed, I, I just had a comment. Yes. So um, there was a recent publication in pediatrics that talked about uh, race ethnicity among the pediatric residents and subspecialists. And um, there is, of course, an incredibly low percentage of pediatricians that of race ethnicities that reflect the populations that they serve. And it's even more dire for subspecialists. I guess one of the questions is, and we do try to address that in terms of trying to increase diversity, you know, across the board in terms of all areas of clinical practice. But in the meantime, you know, what do we do? And, um, you know, I had an incredibly unique experience spending time in the military as a pediatric intern in residence, where the group was far more diverse. And and it wasn't so much about concordancy, but about the um, opportunity for a collective group of people to have a better understanding of the diversity of the populations that they served and informing each other. And it may be that until we get to the point where there is actually enough diversity of providers for patients to select, we have to think about other solutions. Mm. Good point, good point. I know in other iterations of this, we've talked about implicit bias training, um, and that would definitely follow along with what we do now um, to, in, to kind of facilitate this general openness. So, um, and I, so we can, I, I understand that there have been movements um, mm -hmm. towards this already. So I, I don't think it would be redundant to include it, um, or if we just include it in the, the background information as well as something that is being instituted. Um, but uh, to Pat's comment about concordant care, I definitely think we can readdress this um, in the workforce implementation of diversifying mm -hmm. the workforce. We have some statement in there, and actually, as we talk about next steps, it's on my list of uh, issues for our September meeting that I would like to really actually focus on mm -hmm. based concordant care and have a more in-depth mm -hmm. discussion because there are multiple factors to it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I'm, I'm mindful of is the creative tension, and that's how I will name it, between the clinical provider, the the community workforce in terms of laying on hands and having the direct patient experience and the public health workforce um, that is working more at the denominator in terms of systems change. Um, we have talked about race concordant care and implicit bias on the clinical side. Uh, I think it would behoove us if not now as we do that next iteration to think about what is involved in public health graduate and undergraduate education as a way of, of seeing the linkage between the now a burgeoning number of bachelor's in public health programs and master's in public health and Title V investing in maternal and child health training programs and to have a refreshed look at how do we bring anti-racist work? How do we bring systems change around undoing racism more explicitly into the public health training and then encourage joint training um, so that there can be public health education along with clinical education that's not done as a, a, in a tandem bicycle way, but in a much more integrated way up front. Um, I am a, a recovering dean of a school of public health dedicated to social and environmental justice. And so I speak from an academic perspective at this moment, not in my current role, um, and calling for the integration, if you will, 
uh, and the intersectionality um, from an education perspective around uh, anti-racist education in professional and public health education. So too much for now, but I'm just noticing that we've really gone far on the clinical side and made it implicit that that's part of some public health workforce. When we have investments being made directly through over 150 schools and programs in public health, and it could be a missed opportunity, particularly as the bachelor's and community college pathways for public health education have been expanded. So I want to raise the point that this, this, the tension that I have is that uh, we have spent a year getting to this point and you know, with these recommendations, we have a chance for input along the way and the recommendations will never be complete and they'll never be totally uh, right. what we want, comprehensive. What I first want to get is, is the list of recommendations that we have right now in front of us with some tweaks, uh, something that we can move forward. Because if we, if we add a whole lot more and try to get concordance on opinion, we probably won't get this out until September or November or December. I wanna see if we can, if this is a document that we have with some tweaks that still need to be made that we would feel comfortable moving forward to the secretary. Yes. Yes. I think I think that we are perfection is the enemy of the good. The the notion that Secretary Sibelius said, now do something, right? Now. And be very clear in the cover letter about what's coming next. A year ago in your cover letter, you said, we're gonna address COVID now and be ready for more work coming and recommendations around racial and ethnic disparities are more directly anti-racism and undoing racism. You gave that. And so that is infused here. I would um, encourage us to act now um, based on the collaboration consensus we have and with an understanding in the cover letter about what coming attractions may be and for us to work in an expedient fashion as SACOM to continue to, to have this approach recommendations, put them out, recommendations, put them out and not belabor it to perfection. Good. That, that's, that's my belief also. So thank you. For uh, uh, one, one person, one member's view. I'll be curious about my colleagues, but I have a sense of urgency just to catch the wave. And I think we've done enough work in teaching and learning from each other and with each other to move forward. Any other comments about that? All right. Um, there, there are going to there are a couple that we need some work. That the the one on the Indian Health Service, we need that recommendation, and it's going to be uh, it, it, Janelle. If you could sort of articulate what that and, and Magda, I think brought it up. What that we not adequately fund maternal and child health services in the Indian Health Service? Something fairly generic, but keeping it on the radar. Uh, sort of that would be the one that would be uh, I think is most uh, unclear at this point in time. Okay. Glad to work with you, Janelle. I agree. Um, are you suggesting we do it on offline or right now? What I wanted to say, give us a, a general sense of what it would be, not the words, because we can work with it offline, but I want the committee then to say, yeah, that's the right direction and we'll give approval, you know, even if they don't see the final wording of it, because otherwise to actually vote on that wording later on, um, again, will we'll take a lot of time to get to that point. Okay. What was this? I know Magda, you had sense, you, you made a statement about what that would sort of entail. Um, it would be to specify it adequately fund the Indian Health Service, um, um, health services um, uh, programs and services uh, to address or to prevent maternal and infant mortality. I mean, to, to specify it in the very first sentence so that it is um, uh, focused in its work. Um, and, um, and that would be in the first line and increase immediate funding to the Indian Health Service to improve health, um, uh, to, in, to meet the needs of indigenous people in preventing maternal and infant mortality and severe morbidity. So it's a way to, um, um, contextualize it 
and um, to put some of the remaining work, uh, some of it could go into the, um, uh, into the background section. But those are two examples of what I was speaking of before. Janelle? Okay, so um, I agree with the, those recommendations, Magda, and we can leave the specific money allocations regarding job training and um, increased providers and addressing the staff shortages and um, infrastructure for a later date, but include that in the background as identified right. um, sources of attention. Um, I would advocate to, to keep the little phrase in there that, um, you know, the funding to Indian Health Service in accordance with historical trust obligations between sovereign tribes and the US government. Right. So I would advocate to keep that in there. I would agree with that. I would add that, you know, these are, are excellent examples. Mm -hmm. Again, the more specific we can be, the better. The idea is to pick out the specifics, but make it population anchored, because mm -hmm. that is our mandate. Yes. All right. Um, so, so what I will do with this is we get the specific words for this. I'm going to try to get approval for this document with the recognition that we will send out wording on this specific one to all members and then they can give feedback on it um, independently, not on the whole document, just on this, this one recommendation. All right. Are there any other uh, recommendations that need to be pulled out and discussed? I have a question about um, uh, how to operationalize a comment I made earlier after the um, data presentations this afternoon. Um, we have, um, based on the recommendations that came out of the last second meeting of which I was not present and, um, and also out of the draw group, a particular focus on one surveillance system um, as an example um, for maternal and infant mortality review. Um, processes. Um, I don't have enough information to be able to then specify, you know, SetNet or PRAMS, but um, I'm curious about, about whether or not the committee would want there to be that maternal mortality, maternal and infant mortality review processes to be less narrow and focused or to have something um, that that could be broader. And so I'm having the tension between do something right now and maybe revisit it again. But I just want to make sure the message is we're not done yet. We're just trying to be very specific about this particular surveillance system. And in particular, because it brings in community voice as does PRAMPS. Um, so I would like to get any sense about uh, if, if it's um, too narrow given what we heard this afternoon and make sure we've given full respect to the people who spoke um, their information and truth to us today. One of the also other things on my, on my list of agenda items for the next meeting is actually looking at having a more deeper dive, a deeper dive into maternal and, and uh, infant mortality reviews. Uh, and that might be some place where we can get again, additional information to be more specific on our recommendations. This is one I'm happy to help inform that. I, th I think this is this is general enough to move us forward. And I think one of the recommend one of the statements in the cover letter to the secretary is that um, that that we will be having ongoing recommendations based on what we continue to learn about each of these areas. So we were, like you say, we're going to be pestering him with a, a variety of recommendations over the next 18 months. Any other thoughts? Ed, this is Belinda. One quick thought. Um, one area that I just thought about is, did we cover anywhere around preconception health? I mean, it's really, I mean, if you're thinking about maternal and infant health and yeah. just thinking about the health of, of women of reproductive age, I, I just did a quick search and I don't see the word, but we could have called it women's wellness. We could have called it maybe pre-pregnancy or something of that nature. Yeah. Just yeah, want to make sure that's not an, an area that we missed. Yeah, we're calling it pre-pregnancy. That was one of the th th things we said earlier on. Yesterday. Okay, thank you. And it is mentioned uh, several times. And women of reproductive age, I think is what we right. also 
Yeah, and I think pre-pregnancy is fine. I think individuals that are not thinking about getting pregnant don't see themselves in that. So I think that's why a lot of times you, you see the terminology women's wellness or something of that nature. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. It's helpful, Belinda, to hear you bring up issues from yesterday's to make sure that you're part of that conversation. So an opportunity to have you take a fresh look. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, any, any others that uh, people want to have additional discussion on? Hearing none, I would like to have somebody make a motion that we approve these recommendations that will be sent to the, uh, the secretary with the um, understanding that, that the, any, any clarification that by the, in the opinion of the, the chair goes beyond what we really talked about, uh, will be brought back to the committee with separate response through email. Uh, the Indian Health Service one is going to be one that relates to that, um, and that we forward those to the, and, and that that the uh, specific wording, cleaning up the wording will be done by the chairs of the work groups in, in collaboration with me, um, and that that we will then move that forward. And to, so can I hear that motion from somebody? So moved. I just ask one quick question. World Work. Patient Safety Day. Do you, is there a, a, a place for putting that? Um, to me, it, it's, it is all about uh, maternal and infant um, outcomes, and it's September 17th. Um, Wanda, I know I've got you. Wanda is um, a key person and her team are key people for it. Um, it is a, a global event that will be marked everywhere. So it seems like given the topic is specifically maternal and infant outcomes, it would be nice for us to say something. All right, maybe that could be in the cover letter actually. That is okay. Part, you know, really yes. is personal. Okay. That's right. So, so let's get a second to Magda's motion first. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right. Um, and then before we get into the discussion, well, yeah, so what I'm gonna, I'll come back to a recommendation, a room a motion to actually add that sort of recommendation in the cover letter, which we'll come back mm -hmm. to that. But any discussion about the motion? That's my five seconds. And I'm, I'm a Midwestern mm -hmm. guy, so I go eight or nine seconds. You know. And you got right. a brief of it. And Jeannie, I would be glad to welcome that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. To put, it, to put it in as person who made the motion um, um, and to put it, but to have it added um, strategically in the cover letter so it has primary attention before getting to recommendations given the um, timeliness involved. Okay. And I'll get you the, the literature on it. Assuming this passes. Okay. Very good. Hearing no comments, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? For any or all parts of I don't know, Lee, how we do that in terms of. And Very clear. <laughs> yeah. I'll, take that. I'll take that as a unanimous approval of our of our recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of the good work. I uh, appreciate that. Um, the other issue now? is related to the, the background material. Um, that is a document that I'm not going to seek approval for because it's fairly general, but we've had a lot of input, but I do want to use it as an educational tool for others who, who read that. Uh, so you see what's in front of you in terms of sort of the general comments. I do want to, again, put a little bit more in there in terms about payment reform. Um, and I do want to put some in there about Indian health care. Um, I think there, I'd like to put something in there about uh, data equity, the, the point that Magda made, um, just so that, that the context is compelling enough. Uh, and, and also what Paul Wise had mentioned in terms of what the numbers, uh, I think that was a powerful statement in terms of why the, our recommendations are important. Um, and so I would, I would like to get a sense that, are, are you okay with us 
modifying that, adding to that so that it, it, it accompanies the recommendations as a background piece that puts context to anybody who wants to go into that level of detail? Yes. Yes. Anybody disagree with that? All right, excellent. Then the, the last thing from, from my standpoint related to this, um, and, and Lee mentioned this earlier on when he was talking about prioritizing. Um, we've not prioritized any of these and, I, and I'm not quite sure how we wanna do that, but I know that we can rearrange this document without and, and frame it in a little different way. And our, I was thinking of um, maybe once we sort of outline the, you know, finalize this, send a poll out to folks to say, what are the priority recommendations? What would be the, just like New York City did ranked choice voting yesterday, you know, we can have ranked choice voting about uh, the priorities that we could forward to the secretary saying, you know, these are here, we did uh, 38 recommendations. These are the top 10 that, that we really think are immediate or they, they could be here are recommendations that, that need to be acted on right now. Here are some recommendations that will form some of your thinking as you plan for your moving forward. These are some longer term recommendations, something like that, that we can, can frame these. Um, any thoughts about how we want to, to prioritize these recommendations, if we want to prioritize them at all? Another way to do it versus sticky dots, um, having been to all those meetings, um, is there anything that can wait? Uh, there's a, another way to frame it is that as we go through our sections, uh, is there anything that could be deferred to another time? So that's another way to both put what rises to the top, but also what doesn't have the same sense of urgency, because one of the things about prioritization is what are the criteria we use and are we using the same criteria? And there's a methodologic piece here that um, of process that I think um, is tricky. So that's, that's one um, addition to, to consider um, about how we go about this. And I also am mindful of the challenge from our partner organizations who are taking anti-racist approaches about who makes decisions and how are decisions made. So in setting priorities without having necessarily, other than our individual perspectives, talked about what constitutes a priority and what are the things we're going to consider, I would be uncomfortable with just independent prioritization without some conversation about what will influence our decision-making. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be transparent about the processes we use. Well, given that, I would then move just we that we move the document forward without prioritization. That, yeah. yeah, because I also feel like deferring, you know, if we're going to meet and talk about our recommendations again, the list is going to grow. We're going to build upon what we have. And so uh, deferring until another time, it's just going to be a longer list. <laughs> and, um, and additionally, in, in thinking about ranking, you know, maybe we don't assign numbers to them another, you know, definitely we can just leave it as it is listed. Um, but another idea is to think about them in terms of the, the red zone, which is urgent, right? And the orange zone, the orange zone, which is a little bit less urgent, but still very important and the yellow zone. So there's no green because there's never a green in this, but you could rank, you could not rank them, but prioritize them according to zones or just include it all together. And one of the, the issues that we didn't discuss as a, a group since our um, panel discussion on racism, what I heard and I believe we all heard that we have the opportunity to be bold and specific in terms of discussing how we want to advocate that um, racism is, uh, is at the forefront or no, maternal, maternal infant, maternal and infant morbidity and mortality is at the forefront of a public crisis in a crisis mode. And we haven't discussed that, but that should be definitely on our list next meeting of how to um, talk about the language to encourage 
the um, Surgeon General or the Secretary to use some sort of strong terms, terminology, or we're elevating this. Well, certainly, I, I tried to address that, and we'll, we'll even strengthen the wording in the introduction, in the, in the cover letter, and in the preamble. I mean, it's it's there, and okay. I'll I'll see if it's strong enough uh, in the background paper and in the cover letter. But reinforce that, and um, I mean that's going to be one of the conversations. So, uh, so what I'm in, in in our September meeting is where I, I hope that we had, again can move that forward because that, that's coming up fairly quickly. Um, so what I will do is I will uh, clean up this document as best I can, get input on the, the recommendation related to Indian Health Service, uh, work, hope that I get some back uh, feedback on uh, expanding the, the, the context piece from the various folks who are engaged in, in those various sections, um, and then get back out to you the, any change on that, that one recommendation. And then finalize it with MCHB staff to, to get this moved to the secretary as rapidly as possible. And that's the question, Brenda. What is the timetable? Yep. Um, no, okay, I, I didn't see that. Um, all right, so that's that's that. So what we're doing, we're gonna any other conversation about our recommendations and all of this stuff moving forward? That's all right. The, strong the, work. Thank the, you. Yes, congratulations to all of us for, for a job well done. Oh, I mean, your daddy. Um, so what I did, what I started this meeting is I had you introduce yourselves um, with what are the issues that were of, of primary importance that we wanted to deal with. And I want to try to tap into those recommend, those, your, your passion that you bring related to all of those things. Um, and I know that we're not going to have enough time to go through this to say, how do we want to do that? Uh, but I, but I heard, um, what from, from Tara, uh, it was about, uh, birth defects, access to service, prenatal services from Steve Calvin, racial outcomes, Medicaid payment reform uh, from Magda about sustainability, birth equity, housing, uh, and narrative uh, from Belinda about health equity and workforce um, uh, from Colleen about, you know, a hospice prematurity and violence. Uh, Jean Connery about universal health care, well woman care, and environmental issues uh, from Janelle, sustainability and, uh, and action and truth and reconciliation. I mean, those are some of the things that I, I heard. Um, and I would like to try to build those into our conversations over the next couple of meetings. Um, and I, I, I was hoping that we could get to the, the how. And, and the what, um, but if you're interested in moving forward your issue, I would appreciate it if you could send me a note with saying, you know, this is the issue that I raised that I've had, this is what I see needs to be done and how we might be able to do that. Um, because it's not gonna happen unless you take some leadership in moving it forward. The way things are getting done with this committee is if people who show up and, and do the work are actually gonna be move an issue. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I want to tap into your energy. So if you can give me some, some sense of, of what you're willing to do and, and the, the approach that we may want to move forward on. But for my agenda for September, which is going to be, I can't remember the dates, the things that I have on my list, a discussion about race, concordant care, about transforming narrative to create racial and health equity. It's something that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the County Health Rankings had done. Deeper to dive on, uh, on fetal and infant mortality reviews and maternal reviews in Indian Health Service and financing reform. Those were the issues that, that, that I see are front and center that I would like to uh, sort of try to tee up for the September meeting, unless others have other things that are, are more pressing. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Um, Did we uh, pitch September date? 
there was a, there... going to be di that's going to be discussed shortly. Um, Vanessa will bring bring the topic up for how this will be considered. Yeah, and I did just put them in the chat. If anyone can't wait, <laughs> Paul. Yes, I think all of those issues are important, and I look forward to discussing them. But I would also welcome an opportunity to hear directly from MCHB and other HHS um, uh, units, direct response to the recommendations that we made. I'm very interested to hear what they're doing differently or why they rejected um, or delayed uh, moving forward uh, on the recommendations we made. So uh, I think by September, that would provide enough time to get initial response from, it's not just MCHB, but HHS, um, to see exactly how they're responding to the specifics of our recommendations, um, to know what in fact is different in their approach than it is today. Good idea. Yeah, put them on camera. Right, Magda. Um, and to build on that, Paul, welcome back. You know, the, the, a new data recommendation, but more broadly, which we're gonna move now up into the preamble, right? Ed is about being able to monitor, you know, assess and monitor the implementation and impact of these recommendations. So it's consistent with um, that, um, um, the accountability piece and, um, and seeing return on investment of this particular work. Um, I want to um, acknowledge two other things I heard today, um, because it's not just the how are we going to do this, but who are we? And, um, and so I'm, I recall that there is a lengthy but soon to be completely uh, process about who is SACOM in terms of its composition. We are a small and mighty group. We've been able to maximize this time and we're about to be augmented. And so I'm wondering also in this September meeting about how do we meld this group plus new folks? And I, I don't need to say it now, but I wanna name, um, name that as a challenge so that the we becomes we and we are being inclusive. So that's one question about context. I've got two others of context. The other is, well, what are we gonna do in December? Because I like to think about September, but the reality is that I'm in my last year and, um, and I'm looking at what are we doing over the next three times? You are asked us to put this in the next 12 to 18 months. So I'd like to have a sense of what's the trajectory versus time by time and, and how, how can we imagine when our next um, actionable steps will be um, hopefully approved by consensus as we did today. So I'm looking for a little bit longer arc or trajectory. And the third is hoping that we are in person in December or January, whenever that next one might be, given that we've gone to multiple meetings and not twice a year, which was one of our initial recommendations. I'd be curious, when do we have the ear of the secretary? And how do we plan for that as we elevate this up? If we get our wish fulfilled, and this is the crisis, this is the emergency, we are the group, then what are we aiming for for that audience that will elevate up the political will for us to actually translate what we're doing into action? So you actually teed up the, what was on my agenda for the last part of this meeting. So thank you for doing that, Magda. Um, I'm going to turn it Sorry. over to Lee. To lead to to talk about you know the the membership and the meetings, uh, but I do want to highlight the fact that I am I'm going to be requesting that that I, along with maybe some others, actually get to meet with Secretary Becerra between now and September or whenever it's possible to actually have that meeting. Uh, would like to invite him to our first uh, in-person meeting, which I think is going, to, which I'm hoping will be either in December or January. Uh, so that, that we have that, that kind of connection. Uh, but Lee, maybe you could inform us about membership and terms of office and how we set the meeting dates. Sure, um, thank you folks. I, um, I have a sort of a laundry list of cats and dogs to follow up with you about. 
Some of them are general administrative activities. Some of them are around scheduling. Some of them are around staffing and some of them are around the content of the committee. So I'm gonna run through um, and please um, raise your hand, interrupt, do whatever you need to do to get my attention if um, one of them is a sticking point for you. First, I do wanna put out there that we are mindful of the meetings and the structure of what is taking place. Um, we have uh, very regular meetings with Ed as we work through the agenda, as we select individuals who might be uh, good presenters to add to the discussion and knowledge of the body. Um, these uh, virtual meetings that have taken place as a result of COVID back to back to back to back um, are in some ways very productive and other ways uh, might be improved. So any feedback that you have for this current process would be helpful. I'm finding um, that I, I like not having to sit for eight hours um, virtually looking at the monitor for this meeting, but I'm also finding that the four hours that we take each day to do this isn't providing a lot of time for discussion other than the clearly stated objective. So are we having an opportunity to talk about timings of meetings? Are we having an opportunity to do some of that additional add-on business? Um, we had delayed some of this discussion till the end because we didn't want to distract from getting to decisions on the recommendations, um, which may have been uh, very effective from that end, but it didn't provide an opportunity to, to discuss lots of details around the next meeting. And we've got nine minutes left uh, before, the, uh, bef before we turn to pumpkins. So please provide feedback on that. And I'm gonna provide a couple minutes at the end for Vanessa to talk to you about the next meeting. Second, I wanted to mention that um, uh, Dr. David Delacruz, who has been the designated federal official for the committee for a number of years, um, has uh, taken another position with Customs and Border Patrol um, at, the, at DHS. Um, he has been on a deployment slash detail with NHS for a couple months now, and he has been offered a very nice position there working um, with the response to the um, immigration situation at the border and will continue taking on that position. Um, he is a big loss to me as my deputy and uh, I imagine to you as the committee he in many ways is the diplomatic of our, the diplomatic one of our little pair. I have a tendency to be a little more direct than David, who always seems to make everything nice and uh, friendly and accommodating. So I personally will miss him a great deal. Um, we will try to arrange an opportunity for him to uh, join us at the next advisory committee, just to maybe give you some of his insights on working with the committee over time. Um, and if anybody has anything to say, we'll, we'll try to provide an opportunity uh, to recognize his contributions to the group. I'm pleased to say that Vanessa Lee um, has been uh, selected, uh, offered and has accepted the responsibility of continuing as the lead for SACM, for ACM, and will be serving as the designated federal official for the committee. She has done the training work and has been working with um, the staff in the agency and department to uh, be uh, qualified for that role. And I'm happy to step back from this acting role and turn it over to Vanessa. She has big shoes to fill and I have every confidence in her knowledge, skills and abilities to uh, perform the job well. Um, on the topic of um, topics for future consideration, I held off from um, raising any of these items until after you had all made your recommendations. Um, but from the position that I sit in and the discussions that we have on a daily basis around maternal and infant health, there are a few topics that I would just like to put out there as things that are tough nuts for us to crack and anything that you could provide when it comes to input, insight, recommendations, um, or counsel would be helpful both to us in our discussions as well as future recommendations. One, um, we have been dealing for a long time with difficulties around the definition of severe maternal morbidity, um, classification, counting. Um, it, is, it is a difficult concept to sell, to define, to get our arms around. And I think that it would be useful for an expert body like this to weigh in at some point on what should be or shouldn't be included conceptually 
in those discussions because we are consistently uh, pushed as a federal agency to be counting, to be uh, quantifying, um, and that would be helpful. A second um, a data issue for us is identification, defining, and counting of birthing facilities. Um, when we uh, talk about AIM, when we talk about shortage areas, um, determining what is a birthing facility is, uh, is defined in many, many different ways by different states. It's counted in different ways, and it is a confounding issue for us when it, talk, when it comes to trying to define the scope of the problem. Um, another issue that has surfaced, it's surfaced in this meeting and it's surfacing on many, many levels is the balance between this idea that if you are a qualified, certified, authorized healthcare professional, you should be providing good quality care no matter who the individual is, and the discussion of race concordant care and how that continuum plays itself out. We continue to have these discussions and there is a sea shift in the openness to those discussions. And I think it would be helpful for the committee to uh, weigh in at some level on sort of the controversies, the issues, the context around thinking about this particular issue. Um, and this brings me into discussions of MCH terminology and how we are using it. And um, as Magda has uh, repeated a number of times, who gets to decide the words we use? Um, you know, who is that and what is the control or the messaging that is um, reflected in that? We have uh, heard many people uh, talking about pre-pregnancy, um, talking about birthing people, talking about chest feeding, um, some of these terms are sort of current progressive language that people want to use to not be exclusive in some way. But we are also hearing from the other side that many, um, many in the public do not necessarily understand those terms, identify with those terms, or feel that that is comfortable or representative. And so as we're moving forward as an organization, we want to do the best job we can. And if you could counsel us on um, your views of that and how that should play itself out because we do write, publish, um, have postings on websites, on our websites and other places. And it would be helpful to hear from you on that point. Um, there are a number of administrative details and I'll turn them over to Vanessa um, for her to jump in before I go into issues of bylaws and charter and so that sort of thing. Vanessa? I think Thanks, Lee. Um, before the charter and bylaws, we did want to just quickly touch base, as uh, he said, on the next meeting. Um, I mentioned in the chat, we have two remaining meetings in the calendar year, um, and they were tentatively in the months of September and December. We had really hoped um, September would be virtual and then the next in-person would be December. We have recently been advised to um, make all remaining FACA meetings uh, for the remainder of 2021 virtual um, because of the uncertainty still of when the federal buildings will be reopening and fully open and able to host um, FACA meetings and other um, gatherings. So while we had really wanted the December meeting to be in person, we have been advised to just sort of plan for virtual at this time, again, just due to uncertainties around the building. Um, we haven't selected dates for either September or December. Uh, we were planning to follow up again with a doodle poll to get your input, um, and we will continue to use that process going forward. Um, we have, however, checked some calendars here internally and with Dr. Ellinger, and we do see September 21st and 22nd um, seem to work right now. So I did want to get a sense of how those looked for all of you, um, and we would be two half days again. So again, we're just sort of looking right now at September 21st and 22nd, 12 to 4 Eastern time again. Um, thanks, Magda. We can explore uh, whether we push the December meeting into January in hopes that we could be in person um, that month. Um, just to go out a little further, as Magda said, since some of you are looking at this is your sort of last year of your term, uh, the remaining meetings in the next year would be then March and June. So again, it was a September, December, March and June schedule. We've been trying to honor your desire to meet quarterly. 
Um, I think you guys raised that in 2019, and I think so far we've been able to do that. So just keep in mind, if we push the December meeting to January, we would like, probably land where we are now, where we had an April meeting, and then there was only two months left before the end of sort of this logistics contract we use. So that final meeting would be in June, but uh, you'd have just about two months in between the April and June meeting. So I know that was a lot of information. Again, we'll follow up over email um, and use some sort of polling to get your input for all future meeting dates. Um, Lee, was there anything I missed or Ed? Around well, the was one, I mean, I know I'd raised this issue once upon a time that could we meet outside of a federal building? I was hoping that we could at some point in time meet you know, at a, at a community center where we could actually get some community input. And uh, I, I, it was, that was not encouraged uh, by the, the MCHB folk, HRSA folks. But uh, I think if we're gonna, I, I would love to have a meeting where actually we can actually take some public testimony in person. That's not part of our meeting, but just a hearing, a listening session uh, at some point in time where we can hear people and we it would take some planning, but. And I would like to have that done at a, in an accessible place rather than at a, a federal building. I, I'd be happy to have us explore that idea. I don't know that um, given what we know about um, or what we don't know at this point about um, opening up that September would be a good opportunity for that, but we can explore the next meeting or two to see um, about a uh, uh, a meeting, a gathering, A, of the members uh, together and whether or not that could or um, is logistically possible to do someplace outside of the building. So I hear you, we will explore that. And Ed, as you and I have further conversations over the next few weeks, we can we can look into that. I think one, one thing for me that would be important to hear is um, your level of satisfaction with having a virtual meeting in December. I have been pretty firm with staff about doing an in-person meeting, at least one in this calendar year. Again, I'm not sure that that's going to be possible. We may have to move it to January, but I really wanted to hear whether or not you felt that was a, a, a must have. And if it is a must have, um, then we can push harder um, and maybe move things around to do it in January if, if you feel the urgency in that. If you're fine or if there are those who, many of you may have insecurities about doing that as, as early as December. And if that's the case, then we won't push as hard. What's the thought of the committee? You need, I mean, I personally think we need an in-person meeting. There's so much that we're missing and in, in with the connections. Um, and the discussions that occur outside of the meeting that uh, I think that would be a high priority for me. Is it absolutely essential? No, we're doing, I mean, we're getting by with virtual meetings, but it's not optimal. Unmute, Magda. Sorry about that. Um, I try to keep my mouth shut. Uh, I'm... Um, I, I think that there's multiple issues that have, have come together that might have a sweet spot. And that is to be able to, to travel to the to DC, Virginia, Maryland area. Belinda points out there's excellent Healthy Start and other opportunities for to be in community and hear directly community voice. And so I would pursue the in-person together with an offsite that would make it far more compelling. And I would also add that most organizations, including the city match, uh, CDC, MCH epidemiology meetings will be hybrid uh, into December. And so a hybrid model for those who can and will travel and being able as you have to accommodate those who would either not or, or would feel less comfortable being able to do so. Um, but I think getting outside that building and seeing and being together with an expanded SACOM and grounding that so that we can hand off, that's critical. You know, and a bigger part into, we're gonna be, we're going a little bit long than their four o'clock uh, thing, but I think we can stay around as long as you can, please. So um, we will continue to explore. I, uh, practically one of the things that would be helpful for us to know is we had scheduled December to be the date when we would have the, um, the second meeting uh, after or the, the meeting after the September meeting. Um, 
I don't know the degree. There are many, many organizations planning meetings that have been backed up or delayed meetings. So there is a lot going on in December this year and travel takes up more time to make a meeting happen. So if there are individuals who um, would not be in a position to travel in December for a December meeting, please let us know because we don't want to have this meeting and then only have four or five people be able to attend. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to move on and folks can either put their input into the chat or send it to us directly. There are a few other items that I wanted to mention to you. One, an update on new members. As I've said, the nomination package is um, continuing to move forward. Uh, For those of you who may not recall, the uh, availability for members or the, the maximum number of members currently is listed at 21. Um, we have 10 on the books, I believe, at the moment. And so we are moving forward with trying to fill out um, as fully as possible the number of members that we are recommending. I'm not in a position to tell you how many are currently on the list because some come in um, and some have moved out because of length of time, ethics issues, that, that those sorts of details. And I don't know where all of that is at this, at this point, but we are in the middle of processing that. We are also in, this is a two-year cycle for the process. So we are in the process of generating the next list after that, this month in June and July, to move beyond and get into a cadence with the nomination process so that we are never in a situation again of having as small a committee as it is right now. Not that we don't appreciate the number and the the quality of work, but we would like to have as robust and representative. Absolutely. So um, we are moving on that. And this is one of um, Vanessa's uh, major assignments with the committee at this moment. We continue to accept names and nominations for individuals for the committee, um, and they will be considered, although we have used the list that we went out with last year for nominations as a base because we received over 150 names. We've also collected names from this committee Um, uh, of your sort of nominations of other individuals you might consider. So we we continue to accept those. They will continue to be considered. And we go through a matrixing process to identify um, sort of what areas of expertise, regional representation, race, ethnicity, gender, um, to make sure that the committee is not uh, slanted overly or overly weighted in a particular way. So feel free to continue to submit names. As it relates to the charter and the bylaws, we continue to move through the process with the charter. We need to have the charter uh, completed and approved by September 30th. Some Mm -hmm. of the occurring process and these uh, bureaucratic processes are, um, there's sort of a waiting list for the approval of these based on the urgency. Um, and when the political decision makers have the time to do that. Many of you have been to the airport and you stand it in line for a while. And then the guard comes out and says, anybody who has a flight in the next 15 minutes, cut to the front of the line. And that seems to be where we are right now with the administrative processes and a new administration coming in, trying to make sure that things don't expire. So um, we are in the queue. We wait, although we're also mindful of the fact that there are those who are permitted to uh, jump in front of the line. And I'm just being perfectly honest with you about the process. We have no indication that the charter will expire um, without getting due attention because we're seeing them try as best possible to ensure that none of the charters expire. We have incorporated the recommendations and suggestions that Ed and the rest of the committee have made to both the charter and the bylaws and we're moving them forward as best possible and as quickly as possible. Um, Are there any questions on charter and bylaws? Uh, Vanessa has talked about remaining meetings and I believe that, let me just run through, I believe that covers all of my items. Thank you, Lee, thank you for all your work and and welcome Vanessa as our uh, designated federal official. Appreciate that, you're good. Um, Any other issues that people want to raise in our last minute? Uh, I want to express gratitude to uh, Dr. Ellinger um, for um, just 
providing yeoman's leadership and work um, through uh, to get stuff done. Um, and thanks to all of you for anting up and uh, doing the work. And I, I last, uh, thanks to the support for MCHB and others, of course. And I wanna call out the design that we did two years ago to be able to have working groups that bring in more robust, diverse voices, given how small we are, has been critical. And I would encourage us to consider how we can continue to have that be a doorway, a welcome doorway for um, even broader diverse uh, views and perspectives as we strive in our work for anti-racism. So thanks, Ed, and thanks everybody. Thank you. Uh, the, the, work, the work groups are, are they're not statutory. They, they, they are just put, pulled together to get a job done. So if you're saying, gonna send me a note saying, you know, you want to work on something, we can have a work group related to an issue that you want to work on. That Absolutely. Possible. We don't have to continue these work groups that we have as they're uh, structured right now. Um, so you have a lot of opportunities. As I started out, this is a unique group, very small group, very, you know, we're privileged to be part of this. We have an opportunity to make a difference. I think that our work over the last two days will make a difference. Um, as I led off today talking about pitching horseshoes, um, I think we got a majority of ringers. Uh, we really got the, the maximum benefit out of the work that we've done. Some are close, but they're in the pit. They're in the right area. Um, they may be a little bit left, maybe a little to right, a little bit too far, a little bit short, but they're getting close and we're getting better as we do this. And we're gonna be moving this forward and we're gonna make a difference. So thank you. Thank you for the work that you've done. Uh, and I look forward to continue working with you over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, whatever it might be. So have a good rest of the week. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Ed.